Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. You deceitful, sneaky sneak. You deceitful, sneaky sneak. Hello, everyone. It is I, Shay, and Rindis. Hello. I hope everyone's doing well this evening and or morning and or afternoon. Whatever time in the world it is where you are. Where, yes. What, what, what the tired... Or what solar tired, system yeah. or galaxy or wherever it is you really want to be. You, you know what? That's fair. <laughs> anyway. Uh, this is Jay Story Show, and we are hitting the climax of, the, of this book. The Wind Up Girl by Paolo Bacigalupi. And, uh, well, last we left off, she got real. Like, real, real. Really real. Things got really dark, like I said they would. Um, Anderson is helping to, to start a revolution. We haven't heard from Hawk Sang in a while. He's dead. He might be. Kanya is is doing her best to to contain a a a plague of sorts. And the um, the uh, Praya, who was was rumored to have a very dark and sadistic pastime, proved to be true. As uh, as Emiko was was basically raped and tortured, yep. and snapped and killed them all, tore them to literal shreds. To shreds, you say? To shreds, yes. She quite literally tore them to shreds, proving that she is uh, actually quite dangerous. But we will pick up here and see where all this shit goes. Chapter 33. At noon, an army truck arrives. It's a huge thing, gouting exhaust, astonishingly loud, like something out of the old expansion. She can hear it coming from a block away, but even with so much warning, she almost cries out when she sees the thing. So fast, so awfully loud. Only in Japan, Imiko saw a similar vehicle. Gendo-sama explained that it was powered by liquefied coal, astonishingly dirty and terrible for carbon limits, but almost magically powerful, as if a dozen megadonts were chained within, perfect for military applications, even if civilians could not justify either the power or the taxation. Exhaust clouds swirl blue around swirl blue around it as it comes to a halt. Sm a small fleet of kink spring shooter scooters sweep up behind, ridden by men wearing the black of the palace's panthers and the green of the army. Men begin to pour from the truck and charge for Anderson Sama's tower entrance. Emiko crouches lower in her lower in her alley a hiding place. At first, she thought to flee, but before she had gone a block, she realized that there was no place left to run. Anderson Sama was was her only raft left in the enraging ocean, and so she remains close by, watching the hive of ants that is Anderson Sama's tower, trying to understand. She's still astounded that the people who came crashing through the door were not, in fact, white shirts. They should have been. In Kyoto, the police would have already hunted her down with sniffer dogs, and she would have already been compassionately put down. She has never heard of a new person so completely failing to show obedience. Certainly not anything like her own ugly bloodletting and flight. She burns with shame and hatred at the same time. She cannot stay, and yet it's more than apparent that the guy Jim's apartment, invaded though it is, is her last place of safety. The city around her is no friend. More men pour from the military truck. Emiko slips deeper into the alley as they approach, expecting them to widen their search, preparing herself for a burst of heat and 
motion to escape. If she runs, she can reach the clong and cool herself down before fleeing again. But they only post themselves along the major thoroughfares and do not seem to care to search for her. Another flurry of motion, panthers dragging out of a pair of burlapped hooded men with pale hands. Gaijin for certain. One of them is Anderson Sama, she thinks. The clothes are his. They shove him forward, making him stumble. He slams into the back of the truck. Cursing, the, cursing two of the panther, panthers drag him aboard. They cuff him inside, cuff him beside the other Gaijin. More troops swarm inside, surrounding them. A limousine sweeps up to the curb, curb, purring with his own cold diesel engine. It's strange and silent in comparison to the roar of the troop carrier, but the exhaust is the same. A rich man's vehicle. Almost unimaginable how that someone could be so wealthy. Imiko gas. It's Trade Minister Akarat being hustled by bodyguards into the car. Onlookers pause and stare. Imiko gawks with them. Then the limousine is moving, and the troop carrier as well, its massive engine roaring. The two vehicles tear down the street, trailing clouds of smoke and disappear around the corner. Silence rushes into the void, almost physical after the rumble of the truck engine. She pe hears people murmuring, political, accurate, Farang, general Pracha. But even with her excellent hearing, it makes no sense. She stares after the truck. With determination, she might follow. She gives up the idea, it's impossible. Whenever Anderson Sama has gone, she cannot involve herself. Whatever political problem he has become entangled in will end with the ugliness of all such conflicts. Emiko wonders if she can simply sip, slip back inside the apartment now that everyone is gone. Near the building's entrance, a pair of men have begun handing out flyers to everyone they can reach. Another pair coast past on a cargo bike. It's been stacked with more flyers. One man jumps down and sticks a flyer to a lamppost before hopping back up on the slowly moving bike. Yumiko starts toward the bike to collect a flyer herself, but a prickle of paranoia stops her. Instead, she lets them rattle past, then cautiously approaches the light pole to read what they have posted. She moves carefully, all her energy focused on making her movement appear natural, trying not to draw undue attention. She pauses gently into a gab she pushes gently into a gathering crowd, bumping against them, craning for a view of the sea of black hair and strained bodies. An angry murmur rises. Someone sobs. A man turns away, his eyes wide with grief and terror. He shoves past past her. Yimiko slips forward into the gap. The murmur grows. Yimiko eases closer. Careful. Careful. Slow. Slow. Her breath catches. The psalm debt shall pray. The protector of her majesty, the queen. In words, she forces her brain to work to translate from Thai to Japanese, and as she does, she becomes aware of, of the people all around her. The people who press in on every side, all of them breathing a reading about a wind-up girl who walks amongst them, a wind-up who slaughters the queen's own protector, an agent of the environment ministry, a creature of deadly power. People jostle around her as they try to read, shoving closer, squeezing past, all of them thinking she is one of them, all of them allowing her to live only because they do not yet see. Reap chapter. Mm. Chapter 34 Will you sit down? Your pacing makes me nervous. 
Quatsang clauses in the para, param, parambulation, parambulation of his hovel to glare at Laughing Chan. I pay for your calories, not the other way around. Laughing Chan shrugs and goes back to playing cards. They've all been huddled in the room for the last several days. Laughing Chan is a, is a congenial companion along with Packing and Peter Kuok. But even the most conjugal company. Hawk Sang shakes his head. It doesn't matter. The storm is coming. Bloodshed and mayhem, mayhem on the horizon. It's the same feeling he had before the incident. Before his sons were beheaded and his daughters raped senseless, and he sat in the middle of, of that brewing storm, willfully ignorant, telling anyone who would listen that the men in the K KL would never let what happened down in Jakarta happen to the good Chinese here. After all, were they not loyal? Did they not contribute? Did he not have friends at every level of government? who assured him that the Greenhead bands were but a bit of political posturing. The storm was surging all around him, and he had refused to accept it. But not this time. This time he is prepared. The air is electric with what is about to occur. Ever since the white shirts closed down the factories, it was apparent, and now it, and now it is about to break. And this time, he is ready. Hawks Hang smiles to himself, examines his little bunker with its stores of money and gems and food. Is there any more word on the radio? He asks. The three men exchange glances. Laughing Chen nods at Pa Kang. It's your turn to wind it. Pa Kang scowls and goes over to the radio. It's an expensive device and Hawks Hang is regretting that he purchased it at all. There are other radios in the slums, but lurking beside them draws attention, and so he spent money on this one, unsure if it would even carry anything other than the, than rumor, and yet unable to die, deny himself another source of information. Peckang kneels beside the thing and starts to wind it. Its speaker crackles to life, barely loud enough over the whine of the crank. You know, if you fitted this with a decent gear system, it would be a lot more efficient. Everyone ignores him. Their attention entirely focused on the tire, tiny speaker. Music. So Duang. Hawk Sang crouches by the radio, listening intently. Changes the dial. Packing is starting to sweat. He whines for another 30 seconds and stops, puffing. There. That should last a while. Hoxing works the dial on the machine, listening to the divining winds of the radio waves. Twirls across stations, nothing but entertainments, music. Laughing Chan looks up. What time is it? Or perhaps, Hoxing shrugs. They should be Mai Tai. They should be doing the opening rituals by now. Everyone exchanges glances. Hawk Sang moves through more stations. Music only. No news. Nothing. And then a voice. Filling all the stations, speaking as one voice and one station. They all crouch around, listening. Agra, I think. Hawk Sang pauses. The son that Chao Preya has died. Agra is blaming the white shirts. He looks at them all. It is beginning. Packing and Laughing Chan and Peter all look at Hawk Sang with respect. You are right. Hawk Sang nods impatiently. I learn. The storm is gathering. The Megadons must do battle. It is their fate. The power sharing of the last coup could never last. The beasts must clash and one will establish final dominance. Hawk Sang murmurs a prayer to his ancestors that he will come out of the maelstrom alive. Laughing Chan stands. I guess we'll have to earn this bodyguard money after all. Hawk Sang nods seriously. 
It will not be pretty. Not for anyone who is not prepared. Pa Kang begins pumping a spring gun. It reminds me of Penang. Not this time, Pao Sang says. This time we are ready. He waves to them. Come. It's time we saw to whatever else we can. A banging on the door makes them all straighten. Hok Sang! Hok Sang! A hysterical voice. Mm, more pounding from outside. It's Lao Gu. Hok Sang pulls open the door and Lao Gu stumbles in. They've taken Mr. Lake, the foreign devil, and all his friends. Hok, Hok Sang stares at the rickshaw man. The white, sh the white shirts are moving against him? No. The trade ministry. I saw Akarat himself do the deed. Hulk Sang frowns. It makes no sense. Lao Gu shoves a fire into his hands. It's the wind-up. The one he kept bringing to his flat. She's the one that killed the Sonda Chao Praya. Hulk Sang reads quickly. Nods to himself. You are sure this one about this wind-up creature? Our foreign devil was working with an assassin? I only know what it says on the whisper sheet, but that's the Hichikichi for sure. From what, from the way it describes her, he brought her from Ploenshit many times. Let her sleep there, even. Is it a problem? Laughing Chan asks. No. Hok Sang shakes him his head, allows himself a smile, and goes and digs a ring of keys out from under his mattress. An opportunity. A better one than I expected. He turns to them all. We won't be hiding here, after all. No? Hawk Sang grins. There's one last place we must go before we depart the city. One last thing to collect. Something from my old offices. Gather up the weapons. To his credit, Laughing Chan does not question. Simply nods and holsters his pistols. Slings a machete across his back. The rest do the same. Together, they file out through the door. Hoxing, Hoxang closes it behind him. Hoxang jogs down the alley after his people, the keys to the factory jingling in his hand. For the first time in a long time, fate moves in his favor. Now, all he needs is a little luck and a little more time. Up ahead, people are shouting about white shirts and the death of their queen's protector. Angry voices ready for a riot. The storm is brewing. The battle pieces are being aligned. A little girl hurries past, pressing whisper sheets into each of their hands before dashing on. The political parties are already at work. Soon, the godfather of the slum will have his own people down in the alleys inciting violence. Bok Sang and his men make their way out of the squeezeways and pour into the street. Nothing is moving. Not even the freelance rickshaw men have gone to ground. Even the freelance rickshaw men have gone to ground. A group of shopkeepers huddle around a hand-cranked radio. Hok Sang waves at his men to wait. Goes over to the listeners. What news? A woman looks up. National radio, says the protector. Yes, I know that. What else does it say? Minister Akarat has denounced General Praksha. It's happening even faster than he expected. Hawk Sang straightens and calls out to Laughing Chan and the others. Come on, we're going to run out of time if we don't hurry. He calls to them. As he calls to them, a huge truck comes and comes around the corner, engine revving. It's astonishingly noisy. Exhaust trails behind it like an illegal dung fire. Dozens of hard-faced troops stare from the back as it roars by. Hawk Sang and his men duck back into the alley, coughing. Laughing Chin peers out, following the truck's, truck's progress. It's running on cold diesel, he says, wonderingly. It's the army. Hawk Sang wonders if it, if it is December 12th loyalists, some component of the Northeastern generals coming to aid General Kratcha and retake the National Radio Tower. Or perhaps they are Akarat's allies, rushing to secure the sea locks, or the docks, or the anchor pads, 
Or perhaps they are simply opportunists, getting ready to take advantage of the coming chaos. Hoxang watches as they disappear around a corner. Harbingers of the storm, regardless. The last pedestrians are disappearing into their homes. Shopkeepers are barring their storefronts from within. The clank and rattle of locks fills the street. The city knows what is going to happen. Memories peck and swirl at Hoxang. Alley is running thick with blood, the scent of green bamboo smoking and burning. He reaches for the reassurance of his spring gun and machete. The city may be a jungle full of tigers, but this time he is not some little deer running from Malaya. At last, he has learned. It's possible to prepare for chaos. He motions to his men. Come, this is our time. Chapter 35. It was not Pracha. He's not involved in this. Kanya shouts into the crank phone, but she might as well be raving through the bars of a jail cell for all the impact it makes. Nararung hardly seems to be listening. The line crackles with jumbled voices and the hum of machinery, and Nararung apparently speaking to someone nearby, his words unintelligible. Suddenly, Nararung's voice crackles loud blotting out the background sounds. I am sorry, we have our own information. Kanya scowls at the whisper sheets on her desk, the ones that Pai brought in with a grim smile. Some speak of the fallen Sambet Shalpreya, others of General Prasha. They all talk of the assassin wind-up girl. Fast copies of Sawati Krumthep are already pouring into the city. Kanya scans the words. It's full of impassioned complaints against the white shirts who shut down harbors and anchor pads, but cannot protect the Samdat Shalpreya from a single invasive. These whisper sheets are yours, then? She asks. The wrong silence is answer enough. Why did you even ask me to investigate? She can't keep the bitterness from her voice. You were already moving. Nurong's cold voice crackles on the line. It's not your place to question. His tone brings her up short. Did Akira do it? She whispers fearfully. Was he the one responsible? Pracha says Akira was involved somehow. Did he do it? Another pause. Is it a thoughtful one? She can't tell. Finally, Nurong says, No, I swear this. We are not the ones responsible. So you guess it must be Praksha then. She shuffles through the licenses and permits on her desk. I'm telling you, he is not the one. I have all the lined up's records here. Praksha himself wanted me to investigate, to find every trace of her. I have her arrival papers with the Mishimoto people. I have disposal papers. I have visas, everything. Who signed the disposal papers? She fights her frustration. I can't read the signature. I need more time to cross-reference who was on duty around that time. And by that time, and by the time you do, they will be inevitably dead. Then why did Praksha set me up to the task of finding this information? It doesn't make sense. I, wa I talked to the officers who took the bribes at the bar. They were nothing but silly boys, making a little extra money. He's clever, then. He's covered his tracks. Why do you hate Prasha so much? Why do you love him? Did he not order your village raised? Not from malice. No. Did he not sell the fish farming permits to another village the next season? Sell them and line his pockets with the profits? She falls silent. Narong moderates his tone. I'm sorry, Kanya. There's nothing we can do. We are certain of his crime. We have authorization from the palace to resolve this. With riots, she shoves the whisper sheets off her desk. With a burning of the city. Please, I can stop this. It's not necessary. 
I can find the proof we need. I need. I can prove that the wind-up is not Pratchett's. I can prove it. You're too close to this. Your loyalties are divided. I am loyal to our queen. Just give me a chance to stop this madness. Another pause. I can give you three hours. If you have nothing by sunset, I can do nothing more. But you'll wait until then. She can always hear the smile on the other end of the line. I will. And then the line is closed. And she is alone in her office. J.D. settles himself back on her desk. I'm curious. How will you prove Pratchett's innocence? It's obviously that he's the one who placed her. Why can't you leave me alone? Kanya asks. J.D. smiles. Because it's Sanuk. Very fun to watch you flail around and try to run for two masters. He pauses, studying her. Why do you care what happens to General Pacha? He's not your real patron. Kanya looks at him with hatred. She waves at the whisper sheets strewn about her office. It's just like it was five years ago. With Pracha and Prime Minister Sudowong with the December 12th gatherings. J.D. studies the whisper sheets. Akarat moving against us this time, though. So it's not entirely the same. Outside the window of her office, a Megadon bellows. J.D. smiles. You hear that? We're army. There's no way you can keep these two old bulls from clashing. I don't know why you would even try. Racha and Akarat have been bellowing and snorting at each other for years. It's time we have a good, had a good fight. This isn't Muay Thai, J.D. No, you're right about that. For a moment, his smile turns sad. Kanya stares at the whisper sheets, the collected paperwork on the wind-up's import. The wind-up is missing, but still, it came from the Japanese. Kanya studies the notes. She was brought across on a dirigible flight from Japan, an executive assistant. And a killer, J.D. interjects. Shut up, I'm thinking. A Japanese wind-up, an abandoned bit of the island nation. Kanya stands abruptly, grabs her spring gun and shoves it into her holster as she gathers, gathers papers. Where are you going? J.D. asks. She favors him with a thin smile. If I told you, that would take away the sunuk. J.D.'s fee grins. Now you're getting into the spirit of things. I like that he's still in the book after he's gone. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. And I like how he was re-implemented. It's like... Is she seeing things? Is, she, is he really there? It's a fun little bit. The crowd around Emiko grows. People jostle her. There's nowhere to run. She's in the open, waiting to be discovered. Her first urge is to slash her way free, to fight for survival, even though there's no hope of escaping the crowd before she overheats. I will not die like an animal. I will fight them. They will be heat. She forces down that increasing panic, tries to think. More people squeeze around her, trying to get close to the posted sheet. She's trapped among them, but no one has noticed her yet, as long as she doesn't move. The press of the crowd is almost an advantage. She can barely shake, let alone display the stutter stop motion that motions that would betray her. Slowly, carefully, Imiko allows herself to lean against the people to push slowly through them. Head down, pretending to be a woman sobbing, shaking with grief at a, at a blow against the palace. She stares at her feet, finding her way through the crowd, pressing carefully through until she reaches the outer edge. People huddle in groups, crying, sitting on the ground, staring around the street, stunned. Himiko feels a certain pity for them, 
remembers watching Gendo-sama board his dirigible after he told her that he had done her a kindness, even as he abandoned her to the streets of Kronkta. Focus, she tells herself angrily. She needs to get away, needs to reach the alley where people will not notice her. Wait for darkness. Your description is everywhere, on methane posts, on the street, being trampled by the crowds. You have nowhere to go. She stifles the thought. The alley is enough. The alley first, then a new plan. She keeps her eyes on the ground, clutches herself, and minds at sobbing. Shuffles for the alley, slowly, slowly. You, get over here. Yumiko freezes, forces herself to look up slowly. A man beckons her, angry. She starts to speak, to protest, but someone behind her speaks instead. You have something to say to me, hee -ya. A young man pushes past her, wearing a yellow headband and carrying a fist full of leaflets. What's that you've got there, boy? Others begin to drift over to watch the argument. The two start shouting at one another, posturing as they each try to establish dominance. Others start to take sides, to shout encouragement, emboldened by the older slaps, emboldened. The older slaps the younger and tries to tear off his yellow headband. You are not for the queen. You are a traitor. He strips the flyers from the young man's hand and throws them onto the ground stamps on them. Get out of here. Take he up Pratchas lies with you. The leaflets blow through the crowd. Himiko catches a glimpse of Akarat's face, drawn in a caricature, smiling as he tries to as he tries to eat the Grand Palace. The younger one scrambles after the leaflets. They're not lies. Akarat seeks to tear down the queen. It's obvious. People in the crowd jeer at him, but others shout encouragement. The boy turns away from the man, speaks to the crowd. Agarat is hungry for power. He always wants the man kicks him in the ass. The boy whirls, enraged and attacks. Himiko sucks in her breath. The boy is a fighter, Muay Thai for certain. His elbow smashes into the man's head. The man collapses. The boy stands over him, screaming epithets, but his voice is drowned out by the crowd shouting, and others surge forward, enveloping him in, in, him in a clot of fists. His screams fill the street. Imiko turns and slips through the growing fight, no longer careful of her movements. People jostle her, rushing to aid or defend, and she shoves through as quickly as she can. In this moment, she is, n she is nothing to any of these people. She stumbles out of the, ri out of the riot and into the alley shadow. The fight is spreading down the street. Imiko hunts for garbage to cover herself. Behind her, glass shatters. Someone is screaming. She huddles beside, beside a shattered weatherall crate, pulling refuse around her. Durian rinds the, ripe, the ripped hemp of a basket, discarded banana leaves, anything to give her cover. She freezes and hunkers low as riders pelt down pelt down the alley, shouting. Everywhere she looks, she sees faces twisted with rage. Chapter 37. Chapter 37. The main compound of Mishimoto and company lie on the far side of the water in Thornbury. A boat makes its way into, the, into a clone. Kanya's hand, careful on the tiller, even here, outside of Bangkok proper, whisper sheets complain of Pracha and the wind-up killer. Do you think it's a good idea to come alone? JD asks. I've got you. It's enough company for anyone. I'm not so great at Muay Thai in this state. Mm, pity. The company's gates and jetties rise over the waves. The late afternoon sun scalds down on them. A water merchant paddles close, but even though Kanya is hungry, she does not dare waste even a moment. 
Alrighty, the sun seems to be crashing out out of the sky. Her boat, boat thumps against the pier, and she whips its its bow rope bow rope around a cleat. I don't think I don't think they'll let you in, JD says. Kanya doesn't bother answering. It's odd that he has remained with her all the way across the water. The pattern of, the, of his fee, fee was to take interest in her for a short time and then drift off to other things and other people. Perhaps he visited his children, made apology, apologies to Shea's mother, but now he's with her all the time. JD says, they won't be impressed with that white uniform either. They've got too much influence with the trade ministry and the police. Kanya doesn't answer, but sure enough, a Thonbury detachment of a police patrol guards the main gates of the compound. All around, the sea and clongs lap. The Japanese are forward-looking and have built themselves entirely on the water. On floating bamboo rafts that are said to lie nearly 50 feet thick, creating compounds nearly impervious to, to the floods and tides of the Shao Freya River. I, I need to speak with Mr. Yashimoto. He is, he is not available. It concerns property of his that was damaged during the unfortunate raids. Oops. Unfortunate raids on the air fields. Paperwork for reparations. The guard smiles uncertainly. Ducks inside. JD snickers. Clever. Kanya makes a face at him. At least you have some use. Even if I'm dead. A moment later, they are being led into the halls of the compound. It is not a long walk. High walls obscure all evidence of manufacturing activity. The Megadont Union complains that no work could be accomplished without a power source, and yet the Japanese neither import their own Megadonts nor hire the Union. It reeks of illegal technology, and yet the Japanese have provided a great deal of technological assistance to the kingdom in return for Thai seed stock advances. The Japanese provide the best of their, of their sailing technologies, and so everyone is exquisitely careful not to ask too many questions about how a ship's hull is built, and if the development process is entirely legal. A door opens. A pretty girl smiles and bows. Kanya nearly draws her spring gun. The creature before her is a wind-up. The girl doesn't seem to notice Kanya's unease, though simply motions in her stutter stop way for her to enter. Inside, the room is carefully decorated with tatami mats and sumi-e pa paintings. sumi -e paintings. A man Kanya assumes is Mishimoto, Mishimoto Neal's painting. The wind-up leads Kanya to a seat. JD admires the art on the walls. He painted it all, you know. How do you know? I came to see if they really have tin hands in their factory. Right after I died. And do they? JD shrugs. Go look your, for yourself. Mr. Yashimoto dips his brush and an, exqui an exquisitely swift motion completes the painting. He rises and bows to Kanya. He begins speaking in Japanese. The wind-up's own voice follows a second later with a translation into Thai. I am honored by your visit. He is silent for a moment, and the wind-up girl falls silent as well. She is very pretty, Kanya supposes, in a strange porcelain way. Her cropped jacket is open at the collar, revealing the hollow of her throat, and her pale, and her pale skirt molds fetchingly around her hips. She would be beautiful if she were not so perverse. You know why I'm here. He nods shortly. We have heard rumors of an unfortunate incident and have seen our country discussed in your papers and whisper sheets. He looks at her significantly. 
Many voices are being raised against us. Most unfair and inaccurate observations. Kanya nods. We have questions. I wish to assure you that we are a friend to the Thai. From times long ago, we cooperated in the Great War to now. We have always been a friend of the Thai. I want to know how... Yashimoto interrupts again. Tea? He offers. Kanya forces herself to remain polite. You are very kind. Yashimoto mo motions to the, to the wine-up girl, and she stands and leaves the room. Unconsciously, Kanya relaxes. The creature is unsettling, and yet now that she is gone, silence stretches between them as they wait for the translator to return. Kanya feels seconds ticking away, minutes being lost, time, 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 moving. Storm clouds gathering, and here she sits, waiting for tea. The wind-up girl returns, kneels beside them at the low table. Kanya forces herself not to speak, not to interrupt the girl's precise whisking and steeping of the tea. But it is an effort. The wind-up girl pours, and as Kanya watches the creature's strange movements, she thinks she, she thinks she sees a little of what the Japanese desired from their engineered servants. The girl's perfect, precise as clockwork and contextualized by, a, by the tea ceremony. All her emotions take on a ritual grace. The wind-up carefully does not, does not observe Kanya in return, does not say anything about her being a white shirt, does not observe that in another context Kanya would happily mulch her. She ignores Kanya's environment and street uniform entirely, exquisitely polite. Yashimoto waits for Kanya to sip her tea, then sips himself, sets his tea deliberately on the table. Our countries have been friends always, he says. Ever since our emperor made a gift of tilapia to the kingdom in the time of your great scientist, King Bumilbol's Bumil, time, King Bumilbol's. We have always been steadfast. He looks at her significantly. I hope we can help you in this matter, but I wish to emphasize that we are friends of your country. Tell me about wind-ups, Kanya asks. Yashimoto nods. What do you wish to know? He smiles, motions at the girl kneeling beside them. This one you can see for yourself. Kanya keeps her expression impassive. It's difficult. The creature beside her is beautiful. Her skin is sleek, her movements surprisingly elegant, and she makes Kanya's skin crawl. Tell me why you have them. Yashimoto shrugs. We are an old nation. Our young are few. Good girls like Hiroko fill the gap. We are not the same as the Thai. We have calories, but no one to provide the labor. We need personal assistance, workers. Kanya carefully makes a show of disgust. Yes, you Japanese are very different. And except for your country, we have never granted this sort of niche. Crime, JD supplies. Exemption, she finishes. No one else is allowed to bring in creatures like this one. She nods unwillingly at the translator, trying to hide the disgust in her voice. No other country, no other factory. We are aware of the privilege, and yet you abuse it by bringing a military wind-up. Hiroko's words cut her off even as Kanya continues to speak. Hiroko instead picks up the vehement response from her owner. No, it is impossible. We have no contact with such technology. None. Yashimoto's face is flushed and Kanya wonders at his sudden anger. What sort of cultural insult has she unwittingly delivered? The wind-up girl continues her translation. No trace of emotion in her own face as she speaks with her owner's voice. 
We work with new Japanese, like Hiroko. She is loyal, thoughtful, and skilled, and a necessary tool. She is a necess as necessary as a hoe for a farmer, or a sword for a samurai. Strange that you mention a sword. Hiroko is no military creature. We do not have such technology. Connie reaches into her, her pocket and slaps down the picture of the wind-up killer. And yet, one of yours, imported by you, registered to your staff, has now assassinated the Sonda Chalpreya and eight others, and disappeared into thin air, as if she is some raging fee. But you sit before me and tell me that it is impossible for a military wind-up to be here. Her voice rises to a shout, and the wind-up girl's translation finishes at a similar intensity. Yashimoto's face stills. He takes the picture and studies it. We will have to check our records. He nods to Hiroko. She takes the photo and disappears out the door. Kanya watches Yashimoto for traces of anxiety or nervousness, but there are none. Irritation she sees, but no fear. She regrets that she cannot speak directly with the man. Listening to her words echo into Japanese, Kanya wonders what surprise is lost when the wind-up girl delivers them. What preparation Hiroko provides for his shock? They wait. He silently offers more tea. She refuses. He does not drink any more himself. The tension in the room is so thick that Kanya half expects the man to leap to his feet and cut her down with, with the ancient sword that adorns the wall behind him. A few minutes later, Hiroko returns. She hands the picture back to Kanya with a bow, then speaks to Yashimoto. Neither of them betray any emotion. Hiroko kneels again beside them. Yashimoto nods at the photograph. You are sure this was the one? Kanya nods. There is no question. And this assassination explains the increasing rage in the city. There are crowds gathering outside the factory. Boat people. The police have driven them away. But they are coming with torches. Kanya stifles her nervousness at the increasing frenzy. Everything is moving too fast. At some point, Akarat and Pracha will be unable to back off without losing face, and then everything will be lost. The people are very angry, she says. It is misplaced anger. She is not a military wind-up. When Kanya tries to challenge him, he looks at her fiercely, and she subsides. Nishimoto knows Nishimoto knows nothing of military wind-ups. Nothing. Such creatures are kept under strict control. They are used by our defense ministry only. I could never possess one. He locks eyes with her. Never. And yet, he continues to speak with Hiroko translating. I know the wind-up you described. She has fulfilled her duty. The wind-up girl's voice breaks off even as the old man continues speaking. She straightens and her eyes flick back to Mishimoto. He frowns at her break in the decorum. Says something to the wind-up. She ducks her head. Hey! Another pause. He nods at her to continue. She regains her composure, finishes translating. She was destroyed according to requirements rather than... rather than... repetition. Repatriated. Repatriated. Rather than repatriated. The wind up stark eyes are on Kanya, steady, unblinking now, betraying nothing of the surprise she invinced a moment before. Kanya watches the girl and the old man. Two alien people, and yet and yet she apparently survived, she says finally. I was not the manager at the time, Yashimoto says. I can only speak to what I know from our records. Records lie, apparently. You are correct. For this, there is no excuse. I am ashamed of what others have done, but I have no knowledge of the thing. Kanya leans forward. 
if you cannot tell me how she survived, then please tell me how it is that this girl, capable of killing many men in the space of heartbeats, could come into this country. You tell me she is not a military, but to be direct, I'm having difficult believing that she is not. This is a gross breach of our country's agreements. Unexpectedly, the man's eyes crinkle with a smile. He picks up his tea, sips, considering the question, but the mirth does not leave his eyes, even as he finishes his, his tea. This I can answer. Without warning, he flings his cup at Hiroka's face. Kanya starts to cry out. The wind-up girl's hand blurs. The teacup smacks into her palm. The girl gapes at the cup in her hand, as surprised, apparently, as Kanya. The Japanese man gathers the folds of his kimono around himself. All new Japanese are fast. You have mistaken the question to ask. How they use their innate qualities is a question of their training, not their physical capabilities. Hiroko has been trained from birth to pace herself appropriately with decorum. He nods at her, at her skin. She is manufactured to have porcelain skin and reduced pores, but in beans she is subject to overheating. A military windup will not overheat. It is built to expand considerable to expend considerable energy without impact. Poor Hiroko here would die if she exerted herself like that over any significant amount of time. But all wind-ups are potentially fast. It is in their genes. His tone becomes serious. It is surprising, though, that one has shaken off her training. Unwelcome news. New people serve us. It should not have happened. So your Hiroko here could do the same thing, kill eight men, armed ones? Hiroko jerks and looks at Yashimoto, dark eyes widening. He nods, says something, his tone gentle. Hi. She forgets to translate, then finds her words. Yes, it is possible, unlikely, but possible. She continues. But it would take an extraordinary stimulus to do so. New people value discipline, order, obedience. We have a saying in Japan. New people are more Japanese than the Japanese. Yashimoto places a hand on Hiroko's shoulder. Circumstances would have to be extraordinary to make Hiroko into a killer. He smiles confidently. This one you seek has fallen far from her pop proper place. You should destroy her before she can cause any more damage. We can provide assistance. He pauses. Hiroka here can help you. Kanya tries not to recoil, but her face gives her away. An extraordinary circumstance. Like rape and torture. Yep. Almost like if you push someone to the edge, they snap. Yeah. Also, he just outright said, yeah, we kill them when we're done. Yep. They're not people. Mm-hmm. Captain Kanya, I do believe you're smiling. JD's fee is still with her perched on the prow of the skiff as it cuts across the shallow Freya's wide mouth on a stiff breeze. Spray blow blows through his form, leaving him unaffected, even though Kanya expects him to be drenched each time. She favors him with a smile, allowing her sense of well-being to reach out to him. Today, I did something good. JD grins. I listened to both ends of the conversation. Agrat and Narong are, were very impressed with you. Kanya pauses. You were with them as well. He shrugs. I can go almost anywhere, it seems. Except on to your next life. He shrugs again and smiles. I still have work here. Harassing me, you mean. But her words have no venom. Under the warm light of the setting sun, 
With the city opening before her, waves splashing against her boat, her boat's hull as they cut across the water, Kanya can only be grateful that the conversation went so well. Even as she was talking to Narong, Narong they were issuing order, orders for their people to pull back. She heard the radio announcement go out. They would meet with the December 12th loyalists, the beginning of a stand down. The Japanese had not been so willing to take the blame for their rogue windup. It might have been different. But reparations are already being offered, and Pratcha is it, it was exonerated by the copious documentation the Japanese offered. And for once, all things were turning out well. <laughs> Kanya can't help but feel a measure of pride. Wearing the yoke of two patrons has finally paid off. She wonders if it is Kama that places her that places her so that she can bridge the gap between General Pracha and Minister Akarat for the good of Krumthep. Certainly, no one else could have pierced the barriers of face and pride that the two men of their factions had erected. JD is still grinning at her. Imagine the things our country could accomplish if we were not always fighting one another. In a burst of optimist optimism, Kanya says, maybe anything is possible. JD laughs, you still have a wind-up to catch. Involuntarily, Kanya's eyes go to her own wind-up girl. Hiroko has folded her legs under her and gazes out at the city that is rapidly approaching, watching with curious eyes as they thread between clipper ships and sailing skiffs and kink spring patrol boats. As if sensing Kanya's gaze, she turns, their eyes lock. Kanya refuses to drop her gaze. Why do you hate new people? The wind-up asks. J.D. laughs. Can you lecture her about niche nature? Kanya looks away, glances behind her at the floating factories and drowned Thonbury. The, the Prang and Vatarun stand tall against the blood-red sky. Again, the question comes. Why do you hate my kind? Kanya eyes the woman. Will you be mulched when, when Yashimoto-sama returns to Japan? Hiroko lowers her gaze. Kanya feels obscurely embarrassed that she seems to have hurt the wind-up's feelings. She shakes off the guilt. It's just a wind-up. It apes for the motions of humanity, but it's, it is only a dangerous experiment that has been allowed to proceed far too far. A wind-up stutter-stop motion and the telltale jerk of a genetically engineered piece. A smart one, and a dangerous one if pushed, apparently. Kanya watches the water as she guides her craft across the waves, but still she watches the wind-up out of the corner of her eye, viscerally aware that this wind-up contains the same wild speed of the other one, that all these wind-ups have the potential to become lethal. Hiroko speaks again, we are not all like the ones you hunt. Kanya turns her gaze back on the wind-up. You are all unnatural. You are all grown in test tubes. You all go against niche. You all have no souls and have no kama. And now one of you has. She breaks off, overwhelmed at the enormity. Destroyed our queen's protector. You are more than similar enough for me. Hiroko's eyes harden. Then send me back to Mishimoto. Kanya shakes her head. No, you have your uses. You are good proof, if nothing else, that all wind-ups are, are dangerous. And that the one we hunt is not a military creature. For that you will be useful. We are not all dangerous, she insists again. Kanya shrugs. Mr. Yashimoto says you will try to be of some help in finding our killer. If that's true, then I have a use for you. If not, I would just as soon compost you with the rest of our daily dung collection. Your master insists that you be useful, though I can't think how. 
Hiroko looks away across the water to her factories on the far side. I think you heard of her feelings, JD murmurs. Are their feelings any more real than their souls? Kanya leans against the tiller, angling the little skiff toward the docks. There's still so much to be done. Abruptly, Hiroko says, she will seek a new patron. Kanya turns, surprised. What do you mean? She has lost her Japanese owner. She has now lost this man who ran the bar she worked for. She killed him. Hiroko shrugs. It is the same. She has lost her master. She must find a new one. How do you know? Hiroko looks at her coldly. It is in our genes. We seek to obey. We have others direct us. It is a necessity, as important as water for a fish. It is the water we swim in. Yashimoto-sama speaks correctly. We are more Japanese even than the Japanese. We must serve within a hierarchy. We must find a master. What if this one is different? What if this one doesn't? She will. She has no choice. Just like you. Hiroko's dark eyes sweep back to her. Just so. Is there a flicker of rage and despair in those eyes, or does Kanya simply imagine it? Is it something Kanya assumes must be lurking deep within an anthropomorphizing of a thing that is not and never will be human? A pretty puzzle. Kanya returns her attention to the water and their imminent arrival, checks the surrounding waves for other crafts. She will have to jostle she will have to jostle with for slip, hate, slip space. She frowns. I don't know those barges. Hiroko looks up. You keep such close watch on the waters. Kanya shakes her head. I used to work the docks when I was first inducted. Spot grades, checking imports, good money. She studies the barges. Those are built for heavy loads, more than, more than just rice. I haven't seen, she trails off, her heart starting to pound as she watches the machines wallow forward. Great dark beasts, implacable. What is it? They aren't spring driven. Yes? Kanyo pulls at her sail, letting the breeze of the river Delta yank at the small boat cutting away from the oncoming craft. It's military. They're all military. Hey. Dun, dun. So close to the end. I need a drink. Dun, dun, dun. So, I have a hard time deciding if uh, if this is like one long uh, climax, or if they are multiple climaxes. Here we go. Chapter 38. Anderson can barely breathe under the hood. The blackness is total, hot with his own breath and, su and suppressed fear. No one explained why he was being hooded and marched out of the flat. Carlisle was awake by then, but when he tried to protest their treatment, one of the panthers clipped his ear with a rifle butt, letting blood, and they both fall, had, they'd both fallen silent and allowed the hoods to be drawn over their heads. An hour later, they were kicked to their feet and herded down the same to some kind of transport that rumbled with exhaust fumes. Army, Anderson guessed, as he was as he was shoved aboard. His broken finger hangs limply behind his back. If he flexes his hand, the pain becomes extreme. He practices a careful breathing under the hood, controlling his fears and speculations. The close, dusty fabric makes him cough, and when he coughs, his ribs send spikes of pain deep into his core. He breathes shallowly. Will they execute him as some kind of example? 
He hasn't heard Akarat's voice in some time. Hasn't heard anything. He wants to whisper to Carlisle to see if they're being kept in the same room, but doesn't feel like being clubbed again if it turns out there's a guard in the room with them. When they were let down from the vehicle and dragged into a new building, he had been unsure if Carlisle was even there. And then they were in an elevator. He thinks they descended into some sort of bunker, but it's ghastly hot in the place where they kicked him down. The place is stiflingly hot. The hood's fabric itches. Uh, of all the things he wishes, he wishes he could scratch his nose where sweat tickles and then and then damp the fabric, leaving it itching. He tries to move his face, tries to get the fabric away from his mouth and nose. If he could just get a breath of clean air. A door clicks. Footsteps. Anderson freezes. Muffled voices above him. Suddenly, hands grab him and yank him to his feet. He gasps as they jostle his broken ribs. The hands drag him along, guiding him through a series of turns and stops. A breeze kisses his arms. Cooler, fresher air. Some kind of air vents. He gets a whiff of the sea. Thai voices mutter around him. Footsteps. People moving. He has the sense that he is being led down a corridor, the steady arrival and recession of Thai voices. When he stumbles, his captors jerk him upright again and shove him onward. At last, they stop. The air is fresher here. He feels the wind of circulation systems. Here's the ratchet of treadles and the high whine of flywheels. Some kind of processing center. His captors push him to push him to stand straight. He wonders if this is how they will execute him, if he will die without seeing daylight again. The wind-up girl. The goddamn wind-up girl. He remembers the way she flew from the balcony, plunging into darkness. It wasn't the look of a suicide. The more he thinks about it, the more he's convinced that the look on her face was one of supreme confidence. Did she really kill the Queen's protector? But if she were the killer, how could she have been so afraid? It doesn't make sense, and now everything is wrecked. Christ, his nose itches. He sneezes, sucks dusty air, and starts coughing again. He doubles over, coughing, ribs screaming. The hood is ripped off his face. Anderson blinks as light spears his eyes. He sucks gratefully at the luxury of fresh air. Slowly straightens. A large room, full of men and women in army un uniform. Treadle computers, kink spring drums sitting in the corner with them. Even the LED wall screen with views of the city as if they are in one of Agrigen's own processing centers. And a view. He was wrong. He didn't go down. He went up. High above the city, Anderson reorients his confused perceptions. They're in a tower somewhere, an old expansion tower. Through the windows, he can see across the city. The setting sun glazes, glazes the air and buildings, a dull, and buildings a dull red. Carlisle is there too, looking dazed. My goodness, you both look terrible. Akarat, standing nearby. Smiling with a certain sly humor. The ties are said to have 13 kinds of smile. Anderson wonders what sort he is looking at now. Akira says, We'll have to get you a shower. Anderson starts to speak, but another fit of coughing overwhelms him. He sucks air, trying to get his lungs under control, but keeps coughing. The cuffs dig into his wrists as he convulses. His ribs are a mass of pain. Carlisle doesn't say anything at all. He has blood on his forehead. Anderson can't tell if he fought his captors or if he's been tortured. Get him a glass of water, Akrat says. Anderson guards push him against a wall, shove him down until he's seated. This time, he narrowly avoids jostling his broken finger. Water arrives. A guard holds the cup to Anderson's lips, letting him drink. 
Cool water. Anderson swallows, absurdly grateful. His coughing subsides. He makes himself look at a up at Accra. <sighs> Thanks. Yes, well, it seems we have a problem, Accra says. Your story checked out. Your wind-up is a rogue, after all. He squats down beside Anderson. We have all been victims of bad luck. They say in the mil they say in the military that a good battle plan can last as long as five minutes in real fighting. After that it comes down to if the general is favored by fate and if the general it where am I? I skipped a line. Yeah. I think it all comes down if the general is favored by fate and in the spirits. Bad luck, this. We must all adjust. And now, of course, I have many new problems that I must adjust as well. He nods at Carlisle. You both, of course, are angry at your treatment, he grimaces. I could offer my apologies, but I'm not sure that it would be enough. Anderson keeps his expression steady as he looks Akarat in the eye. If you hurt us, you'll pay. Agrigen will punish us. Akarat nods. Yes, that is a problem. But then, Agrigen is always angry with us. Untie me, and we'll forget all this. Trust you, you mean. I worry that this is not wise. Revolutions are of business. I don't hold a grudge. Anderson grins, feral, willing to, willing the man to believe. No harm, no foul. We still want the same things. Nothing has been done that can't be undone. Akaret cocks his head, thoughtful. Anderson wonders if he's about to get a knife in the ribs. Abruptly, Akaret smiles. You are a hard man. Anderson stifles a flutter of hope. Just practical. Our interests are still aligned. No one benefits but us dead. This is still a small misunderstanding that we can undo. Akarat considers, turns to one of the guards, requests a knife. Anderson holds his breath as it comes close, but then the blade is slicing between his wrists, setting him free. His arms flood with tingling blood. He works them slowly. They feel like blocks of wood. Needle pricks fall out. Ah, oh, Christ. It will take a little while for your circulation to recover. Be glad we were gentle with you. <laughs> gentle. Akarat catches sight of the way Anderson cradles his injured hand, smiles with embarrassment and apology, calls for a doctor before going over to Carlisle. What is this place? Anderson asks. An emergency command center. When it was determined that the white shirts were involved, I moved our operations here for security. Akarat nods at the King Spring drums. We have Megadonk teams in the basement sending up power, and now one sh and no one should know that we had this center equipped. I didn't know you had something like this, Akarat smiles. We are partners, not lovers. I do not share all my secrets with anyone. Have you caught the wind-up yet? It's only a matter of time. Her likeness is now posted everywhere. The city will not permit her to live amongst us. It is one thing to bribe a few white shirts, another to attack the palace. Anderson thinks back to Imiko, to her huddled fear. I still can't believe a wind-up could do something like that. Akarat glances up. It is confirmed by witnesses and by the Japanese who constructed her. The wind-up is killer. We will find her and execute her in the old way, and we will be done with her. And the Japanese will be made to pay reparations, unimaginable for their criminal carelessness. Abruptly, he smiles. On this, at least, the white shirts and I agree. Carlyle's hands come free. 
Akarat is called away by an army officer. Carlisle pulls off his gag. Any friends again? Anderson shrugs, watching the activity around him. As much as anyone in a revolution can be. How are you doing? Anderson touches his chest gingerly. Broken ribs? He nods at his hand. Where the doctor is, splinting his finger. Busted finger. I think my jaw's okay. He shrugs. You? Better than that. I think my shoulder is sprained, but I wasn't the one who introduced the rogue wind-up. Anderson coughs and winces. Yeah, well, lucky you. One of the army people is cranking a radio phone, gears ratcheting. Akarat takes a call. Yes? He nods, speaks in Thai. Anderson can only catch a few words, but Carlisle's eyes widen as he listens. They're taking the radio stations, he whispers. What? Anderson scrambles to his feet, wincing, pushing aside the doctor, still working on his hand. Guards lunge in front of him, blocking him from Akarat. Anderson calls over their shoulders as, as they shove him back against the wall. You're starting now? Akarat glances up from his phone, finishes his conversation calmly, and hands the receiver back to his communications officer. The windy man settles back on his haunches, waiting for the next call. The flywheel humps, the flywheel hum slows. Akrat says, the Sondat Shao Preya's assassination has brought out a great deal of hostility for the white shirts. Protests outside the environment ministry. Even the Meganaut union is involved. People were already angry at the ministry's crackdowns. I have decided we will capitalize on this. But we don't have our assets in place, Anderson protests. You don't have all your army units down on the northeast. My strike teams aren't whoops. My strike teams aren't supposed to be ashore for another week. Akarat shrugs and smiles. Revolutions are messy business. It is better to take the opportunities that come before us. Still, I think that you will be pleasantly surprised. He turns back to his hand cranked radio radio phone. The steady whir of the flywheel fills the room as Akarat talks to people under his command. Anderson watches Akarat's back. The man, once so obsequious in the presence of the Sanda Chalpreya, is now in charge. He issues, he issues orders in a steady stream. Every so often, the phone buzzes again for attention. This is crazy, Carlisle murmurs. Are we still in it at all? Hard to say. Akarak glances over at them. Seems about to say something, but instead, he cocks his head. Listen, he says, his voice becoming reverent. A rumble rolls across the city through the command post's open windows. Light flares briefly, like lightning in a storm. Like lightning in a storm. Akarat smiles. It's starting. Pai is waiting for Kanya in her office when she comes bursting in. Where are the men? She asks, panting. They were formed up in the, in the bachelor's housing, he shrugs. We came back from the village when we heard things were, are they still there? Maybe some of them, I heard Akarat and Prachas were going to negotiate. No, she shakes her head. Get them now. She's rushing around the room, grabbing extra spring gun clips. Get them formed up and armed. We don't have much time. Pai stares at Hiroko. It's that a wine cup? Don't worry about her. Do you know where General Prasha is? He shrugs. I heard he inspected our walls and then he was going to speak with Megadon Union about the protests. She grimaces. Get the men formed up. We can't wait anymore. You're crazy. An explosion shakes the ground. Outside, trees crackle as they crash to the ground. Pai leaps to his feet, a look of shock on his face. He runs to the window and stares outside. A warning klaxon starts to sound. It's Trey, Kanya says. They're already here. She grabs her spring gun. Hiroko is preternat pre preternaturally still, standing with her head cocked as she as though she is some sort of dog listening. And then she turns slightly, 
Her attention leaning forward, anticipatory. And God, words, I can words, I can do this. And then she turns her head slightly, her attention leaning forward, anticipatorily. Another series of expo explosions rock the compound. The entire building shudders. Plaster crackles off the ceiling. Kanya rushes out of her office. Other white shirts stream out with her. Those few, those few who were working evening shifts or who hadn't been assigned to patrol in containment on the docks and anchor pads, she dashes down the hall, followed closely by Hiroko and Pai, and charges outside. The night has the scent of jasmine blossoms, sweet and strong, along with the smell of smoke and the tang of something else. Something she has not smelled since military convoys rolled across the ancient friendship bridge over the Mekong and on towards the instrument insurgents in Vietnam. A tank missile. A tank smash a tank smashes through the outer walls. It is a metal monster, taller than two men, jungle mottled and belching smoke from its furnace. Its main gun fires. The muzzle flashes and the tank heaves back on his treads. His turret swivels, gears clanking, choosing another target. Masonry and marble shower down on Kanya and she dives for cover. Behind the tank, war megadons rush through the gap. Their tusks glint in the darkness. Their riders are all in black. In the dimness, the few white shirts who have come out to defend the compound stand out like pale ghosts, easy targets. The whine of high capacity spring guns comes from atop the Megadons, and then the clatter of discs slashing all around her. Concrete chips rain down, Kanya's cheeks open. Che Kanya's cheek opens. Suddenly, she's lying on the ground, buried under the weight of Hiroko, who has, who has shoved her down as more spring gun discs slash the air and crackle against the walls behind her. Another explosion. The noise fills her whole head. She realizes that she is whimpering. Sounds have suddenly become distant. She's shaking with fear. The tank rumbles into the center of the courtyard, rotates. More Megadons pour through, their feet tangled in a wave of shock, tr of shock troops also brushing through the gap. It's too far away to even make out which general has decided to betray Krasha. Scattered, small arms spit from the upper stories of the ministry buildings. Screams echo. Ministry, people are dying. Kanya pulls out her spring gun and takes aim. Beside her, a records clerk takes a disc and takes a disc and falls. Kanya holds her pistol carefully, fires a shot. Can't tell if it hits her man or not. Fires again. Sees him fall. The mass of troops, the mass of troops flowing toward her is like a tsunami. JD appears at her shoulder. What about your men? He asks. Are you going to sell yourself so easily and neglect those boys who rely on you? Kanya pulls the trigger again. She can barely see. She's crying. Men are spreading across the courtyards. Squads leapfrogging under the undercovering fire. Please, Captain Kanya, Hiroka begs. We must run. Go, JD urges. It's too late to fight. Kanya lets her finger off the trigger. Discs clatter around her. She rolls and scrambles for the doorway, lunges back into the relative safety of the building, scrambles to her feet, and runs for the exit at the opposite side of the building. More shells hit. The building shakes. She wonders if it will collapse before she makes it makes the far side. Memories from her childhood, childhood flood her as she jumps bloody bodies following Hiroko and Kai. Memories of destruction and horror, of coal burning tanks roaring through villages, screaming down the remaining paved roads of the provinces in, a, in long columns before plowing out across rice, rice paddies. Tanks running hard and fast for the Mekong their treads tearing up the earth on their way to defend the kingdom from the first surprise incursions of the Vietnamese. Black smoke 
roiling in their wake as they went to hold the border. And now these monsters are here. She bursts the far side of the ministry and into a firestorm. Trees burning, some sort of napalm strike. Smoke roils around her. Another tank smashes a distant gate, coming faster than any Megadot. It is difficult to mind her. It is difficult for her mind to process how quickly they move. They are like tigers, streaking across the grounds. Men fire their spring guns, but they are nothing against the iron shells of the tanks. They are not built for warfare. The clatter of weapons fire rattles along with bright flashes of light. Silvery discs clatter all around, bouncing and slashing. White shirts run for cover, but they have no place to go. Red blossoms on white. Men are disassembling. Men are disassembled by explosions. More tanks pour through. Who are they? Pai screams. Kanya shakes her head dumbly. The armored division ravages through the burning trees at the Environment Ministry's grounds. More troops are pouring in. They have they have to be from the northeast. Akarat is making his move. Pracha has been betrayed. She yanks Kai and points him toward a slight rise in the shadows of the unburned trees, pointing toward where the Fraseu temple may still be standing. Perhaps they can escape. Pai stares, but doesn't move. Kanye yanks him again, and they are off, running across the ground. Palm trees crash down in their path, crackling and flaming. Coconuts rain green around them, along with the with shrapnel bursts. The screams of men and women being torn apart by the well-oiled military machine fill the air. Where now? Pai yells. Kanya doesn't have an answer. She ducks as wood splinters shower, shower her and drive and dives behind the partial cover of a fallen burning palm. JD flops down beside her and grins, not even sweating. He peers over the top of the log and glances back at Kanya. So, who will you fight for now, Captain? Ha! 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 More drink. More drink. More drink. More drink. Where are we at, by the way? Hour and a half. Ooh, really? Yep. I can't read that from here. What? I can't read oh, that. Oh, they're just here. asking how things are going. Oh! Well, that's going well, folks. Thanks for watching. Yes! Yeah. The tank surprises them all. Chapter 40, sorry. The tank surprises them all. One moment, they are riding a pair of cycle rickshaws down a nearly empty street. The next, a roaring fills the air, and a tank bursts into the intersection ahead. It has a loudspeaker that squawks something, perhaps a warning, and then its turret, turret spins in their direction. Hide! Hawk Singh shouts as they all try to scramble off their bikes. The tank's, the tank's barrel roars. Hawk Sang hits the ground. A building face collapses, showering them with debris. Clouds of gray dust billow over him. Hawk Sang coughs and tries to get up and crawl away, but a rifle chat but a rifle chatters and he throws himself flat again. He can't see anything in the dust. Answering small arms, fire crackles from a nearby building, and then the tank is firing again. The smoke clears slightly. From an hour Ali, laughing chin, waves for Hawk Sang. His hair is powdered gray and his face is coated with dust. His mouth moves, but no sound comes out. Hawk Sang tugs at Packing and they scramble for safety. The hatch of the tank opens, pops open, and an armored gun gunner appears, firing with a, spr with a spring rifle. Packing goes down, his chest blossoming red. Peter Kwok ducks into an alley and Hawk Sang glimpses him running. Hawk Sang dives flat again and worms himself into the rubble. The tank fires again, rocking back on his treads. More small arms fire chatters and somewhere down the street, the man in the turret flops forward, dead. 
His rifle slides down the tank's armor. The tank engages and spins on his treads, clanking. Garbage and leaflets whirl around it. It lurches toward Hogsang and accelerates. Hogsang lunges aside as the tank crashes past, showering him with more debris. Laughing Chan stares after the retreating vehicle. He says something, but Hogsang's ears are still ringing. He waves for Hogsang to join him again. Hogsang staggers upright, stumbles into the soy's relative safety. Laughing Chan cups his hands around Hogsang's ears. His shout is a whisper. It's fast, faster than a megadon. Hoxang nods, shaking. Hoxang nods. He's shaking. It appears so suddenly, so much faster than anything he's ever seen. Old expansion technology, and the men driving it seemed mad. Hoxang looks around at the rubble. I don't even know what they are doing here. There's nothing to secure, he says. Laughing Chan suddenly begins to laugh. His distant words tunnel past the ringing in Hawk Sang's ears. Maybe they're lost. And then they are both laughing, and Hawk Sang is almost hysterical with relief. They sit in the alley, resting and trying to catch their breath and giggling. Slowly, Hawk Sang's hearing returns. It's Worse than green headbands, Laughing Chen says, looking at the street wreckage. At least with them, it was personal. He makes a face. You could, you could fight them. Those ones are too fast and too crazy. Fing them, all of them. Hoxing is inclined to agree. Still, dead is dead. I would rather not face either. We'd have to be more careful, Laughing Chen says. He nods at Paul Kang's body. What should we do about him? Do you want to carry him back to the towers? Hok Sang asks pointedly. Chan shakes his head, grimacing. Another explosion rumbles from the sound of it. It's no more than a few blocks away. Hok Sang looks up. The tank again? Let's not wait to find out. They set off down the street, keeping to doorways. A few others are in the open looking toward the rumbling explosions, trying to see where the noises are coming from, to see what is happening. Hawk Sang remembers standing on a similar street only a few years before, the scent of the sea and the promise of the monsoon bright in the air, bright in the air the day the green headband started their cleansing. And on that day too, people had looked up like pigeons, heads swiveling toward the sound of slaughter suddenly aware that they were in danger. Ahead, unmis unmistakable, the, the chatter of spring guns. Hawk Sang motions to Laughing Chen as they turn into a new alley. He's too old for this foolishness. He should be reclining on a couch, smoking a bowl of opi opium, while a pretty fifth wife massages his ankles. Behind him, the rest of the people on the street are still standing out in the open, still staring toward the sounds of battle. The Thais don't know what to do, not yet. They have no experience with true slaughter. Their reflexes are wrong. Hok Sang turns into an abandoned building. Where are you going? Laughing Chen asks. I want to see. I need to know what's happening. He climbs one stairwell. Two stairwells, three, four. He's panting. Five, six. Then out into a hall. Broken doors, stifling. Broken doors, stifling close heat. The smell of excrement. Another explosion rumbles. Distant. Through an open window, tracers of fire arc across the darkening sky and the boom, and the boom in the distance. Small arms snap and chatter in the streets, like spring festival fireworks. Smoke pillars rise from a dozen points in the city. Nagas, coiling back against the setting sun, the anchor pads, the sea locks, the manufacturing district, the environment ministry. Laughing Chen grabs Hawk Sang's shoulder and points. Hawk Sang sucks in the breath. The Yawaret slum blazes. 
the Yarrat Slum blazes, whether all the shanty is exploding in a spreading curtain of flame. Well, it's Yan, Laughing Chain murmurs. We won't be going back there. Hoxang stares at the burning slum that had been his home, watching with horror as all his cash and gems turn to ash. Fate is fickle. He laughs wearily. And you thought I wasn't lucky. We'd be roasting like pigs by now if we had stayed. Laughing Chen makes a, a mock why at him. I will follow the Lord of the Three Pro Prosperities into the Nine Hells. He pauses. But what do we do now? Hoxang points. We follow Thanon Raman, Thanon Raman Twelve, the Thanon Raman Twelve, and then he doesn't see he doesn't see the missile strike. It's too fast for any human being's eyes. Perhaps a military windup would have time to prepare, but he and Laughing Chen are thrown off their feet by the shock wave. A building collapses across the street. Never mind. Laughing Chen grabs Hawk Sang and drags him back toward the safety of the stairwells. We'll work it out. I don't want to lose my head for the sake of your view. Newly cautious, they slip through the darkening streets, working their way toward the manufacturing district. The streets are becoming more deserted as the ties finally learn there is no safety in the open. What's that? Laughing Chen whispers. Hawk Sang squints into the gloom. A trio of men crouch around a hand-cranked radio. One of them has an antenna in his hand that he is holding over his head, trying to get reception. Hawk Sang slows to a walk then urges Laughing Chen across the street, across the street to them. What news? Hawk Sang puffs. Did you see the missile hit? One of them asks. He looks up. Yellow cards. He, he murmurs. His companions exchange glances as they catch sight of Laughing Chan's machete, then smile nervously and start to shy away. Hawk Sang stretches, uh, sketches a clumsy Y. We just want news. One of them spits betel nut, still watching suspiciously, but he says, it's Akarat on the air. He gestures for them to listen. His friend lifts the antenna again, pulling in static. Stay indoors. Do not go outside. General Pratchett and his white shirts have attempted to topple Her Royal Majesty the Queen herself in our duty to defend the realm. The voice crackles out of reception, and the man begins fiddling with the, with the knobs on the wireless again. One of them shakes his head. It's all lies. The one doing the tuning murmur is a disagreement, but the son that shall pray, but the son that shall pray. Akarat would kill Rama himself if he, if he saw benefit. Their friend lowers the antenna, antenna, the radio hisses static, and the transmission is lost entirely as he speaks. I had a white shirt in my shop the other day, and he wanted to take my daughter home with him. A gift of goodwill, he called it. They're all monitor lizards. A little corruption is one thing. But DC will another explosion shakes the ground. Everyone turns, ties and yellow cards together, trying to fix on the location. We are like little monkeys trying to understand a huge jungle. The thought frightens Hawk Sang. They're piecing together clues, but they have nothing to provide context. No matter how much they learn, it can never be enough. They can only react to events, events as they unfold and hope for luck. Hok Sang tugs Laughing Chen's arm. Let's go. The ties are already the ties are already hurriedly gathering the radio and ducking back into their shop. When Hawk Sang looks back again, the street corner is entirely empty, as if the moment of political discussion hadn't existed at all. The fighting worsens as they near the manufacturing district. The environment ministry and the army seem to be everywhere, warring. And for every professional unit on the street, there are others. The volunteers and student associations and civilians and loyalists mobilized by political factions. Hawk Sang pauses in a doorway, panting as explosions and rifle fire echo. I can't tell them apart, Laughing Chen mutters as a group of university students carrying short machetes and wearing yellow armbands runs past, heading for a tank that's busy 
showing an old expansion tower. They're all wearing yellow. Everyone wants to claim loyalty to their queen. Does she even exist? Hoxang shrugs. A student spring gun a student spring gun blades bounce off the tank's armor. The thing is huge. Hoxang can't help being impressed that the army has successfully loaded so many tanks into the capital. He supposes the Navy and its admirals provided assistance, which means General Pracha and his white shirts have no allies left. They're all crazy, Hoxang mutters. It doesn't make any difference who is who. He studies the street. His knee is hurting, his old injury making him slow. I wish we could find some bicycles. My leg, he grimaces. If you were on a bike, shooting you would be easy, as easy as shooting a grandmother on her stoop. Hoxang rubs his knee. It's the, I'm too old for this. Rubble showers them from another explosion. Laughing Chen brushes debris out of his hair. I hope this is worth the trip. You could be back in the slums roasting alive. That's true, Laughing Chan nods. But let's hurry. I don't want to keep testing our luck. More dark intersections, more violence, rumors flying on the streets, executions in Parliament. Parliament? The Trade Ministry in flames. Thamasat University students rallying on behalf of the Queen, and then another radio broadcast. A new frequency, everyone says, as they all huddle around the tiny speaker. The announcer sounds shaken. Hawk Sang wonders if there is a spring gun at her head. Kun Sopawati. She was always so popular, always introduced such interesting radio plays. And now her voice trembles as she begs her countrymen to stay calm while tanks rush through the streets, securing everything from the anchor pads to the docks. The radio speakers crackle with the sound of shelling and explosions. A few seconds later, explosions rumble in the distance like muffled thunder, a perfect echo of the ones on the radio. She's closer to the fighting than we are. She's closer to the fighting than we are, Laughing Chan says. Is that a good sign or a bad one? Fox Sang wonders. Laughing Chan starts to answer, but a Megadon scream the Megadon screams of rage interrupt, followed by the whine of spring guns and leashing. Everyone looks down the street. That sounds bad. Hide, Fox Sang says. Too late. A wave of people pour, pours around the corner, running and screaming. A trio of carbon armored megadons thunder, thunders behind them. The massive heads sweep low, slashing from side to side. Their tusks slash through the fleeing people with attached scythe blades. Bodies split like oranges and fly like leaves. From atop the megadons, machine gun cages open fire, flickering, flickering silver streams of bladed discs pour into the packed crowd. Hawk Sang and Laughing Chin crouch into a doorway as people flee past. The white shirts in their mists fire their own spring guns and single shot rifles as they run, but the discs are entirely ineffective against the armored megadons. The environment ministry isn't equipped for this sort of warfare. Ricocheting ammunition flurries around them as machine, machine guns chatter. People collapse in bloody writhing piles, howling agony as the Megadons trample over them. Dust, dust and smoke and must, musk choke the street. A man is flung aside by a Megadon and slams into Hawk Sang. Blood gouts from his mouth, but he's already dead. Hawk Sang crawls out from under the corpse. More people are forming up and firing at the Megadons. Students, Hawk Sang thinks, keeping, keeping Thamasat but it's impossible to tell who they are loyal to, and Hawk Sang wonders if even they know who they are fighting. The Megadons wheel and charge. People pile up against Hawk Sang, trying to get out of the way. Their mass crushes him. He can't breathe. He tries to cry out to clear space for himself, but the crush is too great. 
He screams. The weight of desperate fleeing people presses down upon him, squeezing out the last of his air. The Megadot sweeps into them. It backs and charges again, tearing into the clot of people, swinging its bladed tusks. Students throw bottles of oil up on the Megadons and hurl torches up after, spinning, spinning lights and fire. More razor discs rain down. Hulk Sang cowers as the gun as the guns sweep toward him, splitting silver. A boy stares into his eyes. Yellow headbands slip down over his bleeding face. Hulk Sang's leg blossoms with pain. He can't tell if it's shot or if his knee is broken. He screams in frustration and fear. The weight of bodies pushes him to the ground. He's going to die. Crushed under the dead, despite everything, he failed to understand the capriciousness of warfare and his arrogance. In his arrogance, he thought he could prepare such a fool. Silence comes suddenly. His ears are ringing, but there's no more weapon fire, weapons fired and no more trumpeting megadons. Hoxang takes a shuddering breath beneath the weight of bodies. All around him, he hears only moans and sobbing. Ah, Jun, he calls. No answer. Hoxang falls his way out. Others are dragging themselves free of the massacre as well, helping their wounded. Hoxang can barely stand. His leg is awash with pain. He's covered with blood. He searches through the bodies, trying to find Laughing Chan, but if the man is in the pile, he is covered in too much blood, and there are too many bodies, and it's too dark to pick him out. Hawk Sang calls for him again, peering into the mass. Down the street, a methane lamp burns bright, shattered, its neck spurting gas into the sky. Hawk Sang supposes it could explode at any moment, ripping through the methane pipes of the city, but he can't muster the energy to care. He stares around at the bodies. Most of them are students, it seems, just foolish children, trying to do battle with Megadons. Fools. He forces down memories of his own children, dead and piled. The massacres of Malaya, writ on Thai pavement. He pries a spring gun from a dead white shirt's hands, checks its load, only a few discs left, but still, he pumps the spring, adding energy, shoves it into his pocket. Children playing at war. Children who don't deserve to die, but are too foolish to live. In the distance, the battle rages, still moved on to other, the battle rages still, moved on to other avenues and other victims. Hawk Sang limps down the street, bodies lie everywhere. He reaches an intersection, hobbles across, too tired to care about the risk of being caught in the open. At the far side, a man lies slumped against a wall, his bicycle lying beside him. Blood soaks his lap. Hoxang picks up the bicycle. That's mine, the man says. Hoxang pauses, studying the man. The man can barely keep his eyes open, yet still he clings to normalcy, to the idea that something like a bicycle can be owned. Hoxang turns and wheels the bicycle down, the, uh, down off the sidewalk. The man calls out again, that's mine, but he doesn't stand. He doesn't do anything to stop Hoxang as he swings his leg over the frame and sets his feet on the pedals. If the man complains again, Hawk Sang doesn't hear it. Well. 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 Shit's hit the fan. Yep. <sighs> Almost there. I thought we weren't going to move for another two weeks, Anderson protests. We don't have everything in place. Plans must change. Your weapons and funding are still helpful. Akarat shrugs. In any case, having Farang shop troops in the city would not necessarily smooth the transition. 
it's possible that this accelerated timetable is best. Explosions rumble across the city. A methane fire is burning, bright and green, yellowing now as it finds dry bamboo and other materials. Akarat studies the burn, waves to the man with the radio phone. The private, the private cranks the, at the power as Akarat speaks quietly, issuing orders for fire teams to be dispatched to the blaze. He glances at Anderson, explains, If the fires get out of control, we won't have a city to defend. Anderson studies the spreading fire, the gleam of, uh, of the palace shetty, the temple of the Emerald Buddha. Buddha? That fire's near the city pillar. Cap, we can't allow the pillar to burn. It would be a bad omen for a new regime that is supposed to be strong and forward-looking. Anderson goes and leans on a balcony railing. His hand, splinted now, still throbs with the but with the bone reset by a military doctor, it feels better than it has in hours. A swaddling layer of morphine helps keep the pain at bay. Another arc of fire crosses the sky. A missile that buries itself in the distance somewhere in the environment ministry compound. It's hard to believe the forces that Akrat has mustered for this ascension. The man had far more power at his disposal than he let on. Anderson pretends nonchalance as he asks the next next question. I assume this accelerated schedule won't affect the specifics of our agreement. Avergen remains a favorite partner in the new era. At these, at these soothing words, Anderson relaxes, but Akarat's next sentence yanks him alert. Of course, the situation has changed somewhat. After all, you were unable to bring certain promises, promised resources to bear. Anderson looks at him sharply. We had a timetable. The promised troops are en route, along with more weapons and funding. Akrat smiles slightly. Don't look so concerned. I'm sure we'll work something out. We want the seed bank still. Akrat shrugs. I understand your position. Don't forget that Carlisle also has the pumps you'll need before any before the rainy season. Akarat glances at Carlisle. I'm sure separate arrangements can be made. No. Carlisle grins, glances from one to the other, then holds his hands up as he backs away. You all work this out. This is not my argument. Just so. Akarat turns back to the arrangements of the, of the battle. Anderson watches, eyes narrowed. They still have leverage on this man. Guarantees are fertile. Latest generation of seed, seed stock. Rice that will resist blister rust. For at least a dozen... Whoops. Rice that will resist blister rust for at least a dozen plantings. He considers how best to affect Akarat, to bring him back into alignment. But the morphine and exhaustion of the last 24 hours are wearing on him. Smoke from one of the fires drifts across them, sending everyone into coughing fits before the wind shifts again. More tracer fire, fire and shells arc across the city, followed by the distant rumble of explosions. Carlisle frowns. What was that? Probably the army's... Oh, probably the army's crew company. The commander refused our friendship after all. He'll be shelling the anchor pads on behalf of Procha, Akarat says. The white shirts don't want to allow a resupply. They'll also go after the seawalls if we let them. But the city would drown. And it would be our fault. Akarat grimaces. In the December twelfth coup, the dikes were barely defend the dikes were barely defended successfully. If Raksha feels he is losing, and by now he must know he is, then the white shirts will try to take the city hostage to force a more favorable surrender. He shrugs. It's a pity we don't already have your coal pumps delivered. As 
As soon as the shooting stops, Carlisle says, I'll contact Kolkata and ship them out. I would have expected no less. Akarat's teeth gleam. Anderson, Anderson fights to keep the scowl off his face. He doesn't like their friendly banter. It's almost as if their earlier captivity is forgotten, and Carlisle and Akarat are old friends. He doesn't like the way Akarat seems to have separated Anderson's own interest from Carlisle's. Anderson studies the landscape, mulling his options. If he just knew the location of the seed bank, he could order a strike team to move in and take, take it in the confusion of this urban war. Shouts filter up from below, people milling in the streets, all of them looking toward the, the havoc, all of them curious what this warfare bodes for them. He follows the gaze of the confused throng, follows expansion towers, follow old expansion towers stand back against the fires, bits of remnant glass windows twinkling merrily in the, in the blazes all around. Behind the city, and the fires, of the black ocean ripple. Uh, the black ocean ripples. Whoops, skip the line. Behind the city and the fires, the black ocean ripples. A sheet of darkness. From high up, the sea walls seem curiously insubstantial. A ring of gas lights, and then nothing beyond the hungry blackness. Can they breach, can they really breach the dikes? He asks. Akarat shrugs. There are weak points. We had planned to defend them with additional Navy personnel from the South, but we think we can hold. And if you don't, the man who allows the city to drown will never be forgiven. Akarat says, it cannot be allowed. We will fight for the dikes if we are as if we are the villagers of Bang Rajan. Anderson watches the burning fires and the sea beyond. Carlisle leans on the railing beside him. His face glimmers in the light. He has the satisfied smile of a man who cannot lose. Anderson leaves it, leans over. Anderson, Agaret might have influence here, but Hagrigen is everywhere else. He locks eyes with the traitor. Remember that. He's pleased to see Carlisle's smile falter. More gunfire echoes across the landscape. From high up, the battle lacks visceral power. It's a battle of ants fighting over piles of sand, as if someone has kicked two nests together to test the clash of trivial civilizations. Mortars rumble, fires twinkle and flare. In the distance, a shadow descends from the black night overhead. A dirigible, sinking toward the city, blazes. It floats low over the fires. Suddenly, a portion of the blaze winks out as a deluge of seawater pours from its belly. Akarat watches, smiling. Ours, he says. And then, as though the fire is not snuffed, but actually airborne, the dirigible explodes. Flames roar around it, pieces of its skin blazing and peeling off fluttering away as the whole great beast sinks towards the city and crashes into pieces of on the buildings. Christ, Anderson says. Are you sure you don't want our reinforcements now? Akarat's face remains impassive. I didn't think they would have time to deploy missiles. A massive explosion rocks the city, green gas burning bright, rising at the skyline's edge, a cloud of flame rolling and expanding unimaginable pounds of compressed gas going up in a, in a roaring green mushroom. The Environment Ministry's Strategic Reserve, I think, Akarat comments. Beautiful, Carlisle murmurs. Fucking beautiful. Ah! Uh. Ah. One moment. Ha <laughs> ha. 
Oh, so close. Hot saying shelters in an alley as tanks and trucks rumble down. Than and Forsey. He shudders at the thought of fuel burning, as it has to be much of the kingdom's diesel stock, all of it going up in a single orgy of violence. Coal smoke fills the air as stoked tanks surge past on clanking treads. Hawk Sang crouches in garbage. Everything he planned has fallen apart in this moment of crisis. Instead of waiting and moving north with a careful unit, he left his valuables to burn for the sake of one long shot risk. Quit complaining, you old fool. You would have roasted your purple bat and your yellow and your yellow card friends all together if you hadn't left when you did. Still, he wishes he had the forethought to bring at least some of that carefully squirreled insurance. He wonders if his karma is broken. Is so broken that he cannot ever truly hope to succeed. He peers into the street again. The spring lake offices are within view. Best of all, there's no guards present. Hawk Sang allows himself to smile at that. The white shirts have their own troubles now. He wheels the bicycle across the street, using it as a crutch to keep him upright. Inside the compound, it looks as though there was a brief fighting. A trio of bi bodies lie against a wall, seemingly executed. Their yellow armbands have been pulled off and tossed into the dust beside them. More foolish children playing at politics. Movement behind him. Hawksang turns and jams a spring gun into his into his stalker. My gasps at his gun barry. Bur My gasp as his gun barrel buries itself in her guts. Mules with fear, eyes wide. What are you doing here? Hawksang whispers. Mai stumbles back from his gun. I came to look for you. The light shirts found our village. People are sick there, she sobs. And then your house burned. For the, for the first time, he sees the soot and cuts covering her body. You were in Yarrut? In the slums? He looks shocked. She nods. I was lucky. She fights back a sob. Hawk Sang shakes his head. Why come here? I couldn't think of any other place. And more people are sick. She nods, fearful. The white shirts questioned us. I didn't know what to do. I told. Don't worry. Oxen sets a soothing hand on her shoulder. The white shirts won't trouble us anymore. They have their own problems. Do you have? She stops. Finally says. They burned our village. Everything. She's a pathetic creature. So small, so vulnerable. He imagines her fleeing her destroyed home seeking refuge in the only place left to her, and then finding herself in the heart of warfare. Part of him wants to be rid of her burden too, but too many have already died around him, and he is obscurely pleased for her company. He shakes his head. Foolish child. He motions her into the factory. Come with me. A furious stink envelops them as, the, as they enter the main hall. They both cover their faces, breathing shallowly. The algae pads, Boxing murmurs. The kink springs have stopped running their fans. Nothing is being vented. He climbs to the, he climbs the steps to the office, shoves open the door. The room is closed is close and hot, and reeks as badly as the manufacturing door as the manufacturing floor. From the long days without airflow. He pushes open shutters, letting in night, uh, letting in night breeze and, and city burn across across the roof, across the roofs. Flames flicker, sparkling in the night like prayers going up to heaven. Mai comes to stand beside him, her face illuminated in the irregular irregular glow. The gas lamp is burning freely down the street, broken. They must be burning all over the city. Hawk Sang is somewhat surprised that no one has cut off the gas lines. Someone should have done it already. And yet still, this one flares, bright and green, reflecting on Mai's face. She is pretty, he realizes, slight and beautiful, an innocent trapped amongst warring animals. 
He turns from the window and goes to squat before the safe, studies its dials and heavy locks, its combinations and levers, expensive to manufacture something with so much steel. When he had his own company, when the Tri-Clipper ruled the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean, he had one like it in his offices, an heirloom, salvaged from an old bank when it lost liquidity straight from the vault and carried into three prosperities into three prosperities training company with the help of two megadons this one sits before him taunting him he must destroy it at its joints it will take time come with me he says he leads her back down to the factory floor my hangs hangs back when he wants to go into the front into the finding rooms her hands he hands her a lying worker's mask should be enough. You are sure? He shrugs. Stay then. But she follows him anyway, back to where they store the curing acid. They walk gingerly. He uses a rag to push aside the finding room curtains, careful, careful to let nothing touch him. His breath is loud inside the mask, ragged, ragged sawing. The manufacturing rooms are disarrayed. The white shirts have have been here, inspecting. The stink of the rotting algae tanks is intense, even through the mask. Foxing breathes shallowly, forcing himself not to gag. Overhead, the drying screens are all black with withered algae. A few streamers dangle down. Black, emaciated tentacles. Foxing fights the urge to duck from them. What are you doing? My pants. Looking for a future. He spares her a small smile before he realizes she can't see his expression through the mask. He digs gloves out of a supply cabinet and hands her a pair. Gives her an apron as well. Help me with this. He indicates a sack of powder. We are working for ourselves now. No more foreign influences. Yes? He stops her, uh, he stops her as she reaches for the sack. Don't get any on your skin, he says. And don't... Let your sweat touch it. He guides her back up to the offices. What is it? You shall see, child. Yes, but it's magic. Now go get some water from the clone out back. When she returns, she has a knife and carefully slices into the sacking. Bring me the water. She pulls the bucket close. He dips he dips into the water with his knife, then runs it through the powder. The powder hisses and begins to boil. Then he takes the knife out. It's half gone, melted into nothing, still hissing. Mai's eyes go wide. A viscous liquid pours off the knife. What is it? A specialized bacteria. Something the Farang have created. Not acid, though. No, it's alive, in a way. He takes the knife and begins to scrape it along along the face of the safe. The knife disintegrates completely, Hawksing grimaces. I need something else, something long to spread it with. Put water on the safe, I suggest, then pour out on the powder. He laughs, clatter child. Soon the safe is soaking. He, he prepares a paper funnel and lets the powder... He prepares a paper funnel and lets the powder stream through in a, tiny in a tiny fountain. Wherever it touches the metal face, it begins to boil. Hawk Sang steps back, horrified at the speed of the stuff, fights the urge to wipe his hands. Don't get any on your skin, he mutters, stares at his glove. If there is a trace of powder on them, if there is a trace of powder on them and they and they are wetted, his skin his skin crawls. Mai is already is already backed away to the far side of the office, watching with terrified eyes. We just make this bacteria that just eats everything. <laughs> Metal pours off the off the face. Eaten discarded iron. Peeling away in sheaves, layers of it flaking away as it blown by autumn winds. The bright, 
The bright leaves of melting iron land on teak flooring. They hiss, they hiss and spread. The flakes burn on, creating a lattice, a lattice of broken and seared wood. It doesn't stop, Mai says, awed. Foxhang watches with increasing unease. Wondering if the yeast-like stuff will eat away the floor below and send the safe crashing down into the manufacturing lines. He finds his voice. It is alive. It should lose its ability to digest soon. This is what the Ferang make? Mai's voice is frightened and awed. Our people have made such things as well. Hoxang shakes his head. Don't think the Ferang are so much as are so much as all that. The safe continues to disintegrate. If only he had been brave before, he could have done this when there wasn't a war boiling outside the window. He wishes he could go back in time to his former frightened, paranoid self, so worried about deportation, about angering foreign devils, about, about preserving his good name, and simply whisper in that old man's ear that there was no hope, that he would steal and run, and it would turn, and it could not turn out worse. A voice interrupts his thoughts. Well, well, Tan Hock Seng, how nice to see you here. Hock Seng turns, dog fucker and old bones, along with six others standing in the doorway, all of them carrying spring guns. They're scratched and sooted from the warfare on the streets, but smiling and confident. We all seem to have been thinking al along the same lines, Doc Fucker observes. An explosion lights the sky, casting orange across the office. The rumble of destruction trembles through, ho through Hawk's hang souls. It's hard to tell how far away it is. The shells seem to fall randomly, if there is intelligence guiding them, it's not for them to understand. Another rumble. This one closer. The white shirts defending the levees. Most likely. Hoxang fights an urge to flee. The cracking of the iron digesting of the iron digesting bacteria continues. Leaves of metal waft to the floor. Hoxang tests the waters. I'm glad you're here. Help me then. Come on. Old Bone smiles. I think not. The men shoulder past Hawk saying, all of them larger than he, all of them armed, all of them uncaring of his and Mai's presence. Hawk saying staggers as they bump him aside. But it's mine, he protests. You can't take it. I told you where it was. The men ignore him. You can't take it, Hawk saying fumbles for his gun. Suddenly a pistol presses against his, his skull. Old Bones, smiling. Dogfucker watches with interest. Another killing will make little difference on my river. Don't test me. Hawksane can barely control his rage. A part of him wants to fire anyway, to steal away the man's smug expression. The safe's metal continues to bubble and hiss, falling away, slowly revealing his last object of hope. The Nak Lang. All watch, Hawks hang in old bones. They're loose, smiling, unafraid. They haven't even lifted their pistols. They simply watch, interested, as Hawks hang points his pistol at them. Dogfucker grins. Go away, yellow card, before I change my mind. My tugs at Hawks hang's hand. Whatever it is, it isn't worth your life. She's right. Yellow card, Old Bones says. This is not a fight you can win. Hoxhang lowers his pistol and allows Mai to pull him away. They back out of the office. The Dung Lord's men watch with small smiles, and then Hoxhang and Mai are going down the stairs and out into the factory, and from there into the rubbled streets. In the distance, a Megadont screams in pain. The wind gusts carrying ash and political pamphlets and the scent of burning weather all. Hawksang feels old, too old to still be striving against a fate that clearly wishes him destroyed. Another whisper sheet tumbles past, 
the headline screams of wind-up girls and murder. Amazing that Mr. Lake's wind-up could cause so much trouble. And now everyone in the city is hunting for her. He almost smiles. Even if he's a yellow card, he's not as disadvantaged as that sorry creature. He probably owes her thanks. If it hadn't been for her and the news of Mr. Lake's arrest, he supposes he would be dead by now, burned in the slums, with all his jade and cash and diamonds. I should be grateful. Instead, he feels the weight of his ancestors pressing down upon him, crushing him with their judgments. He took what his father and grandfather before him had built in Malaya and turned it to ash. The failure is overwhelming. Another whisper sheet flutters up against the factory wall. The wind-up girl again, along with accusations against General Pratcha and... Mr. Lake was obsessed with that wind-up girl. Couldn't stop fucking her. Couldn't resist bringing her to his bed at every opportunity. Hoxang picks up the whisper sheet, suddenly thoughtful. What is it? Mai asks. I am too old for this. But still, Hawk Sang feels his heart beating faster. I have an idea, he says, a possibility. A new, absurd flicker of hope. He cannot help it. Even when he has nothing, he must drive. Yeah. Look at this little, thin, little bit that's left. You're almost there. Almost there. How much time are we at, though? Done. Two, sixteen. Huh. Forty-five minutes. You can make it. You can do it. I believe in you. Almost there, folks. The tank round explodes. Dirt and woody debris showers Kanya's head. They've abandoned the ministry buildings. Giving ground. Giving ground is what Kanya had called it, but in truth, it's a route. Running as fast as they can from the oncoming tanks and megadons. The only thing that has saved them so far is that the army seems intent on securing the main campus of the Ministry, and so its strength remains gathered there. Still, she and her men have encountered three commando units coming over the south walls of the compound, and they have cut Kanya's platoon in half, and now another tank, just as they were about to slip out the secondary, ex the secondary exit. The tank smashed through the gate and blocked their escape. She has ordered her men into the forest grove near Frasaub's temple. It is in shambles. The carefully tended garden has been trampled by war megadons. Its main columns have been burnt by the firebomb attack swept the firebomb attack that swept through the through the dark teak of the forest like a raging demon. Shrieking and roaring. So now they shelter in ash and stumps and smolder. Another tank shell drops into the hillside, into their hillside position. More commandos slip around the, around the tank, break into teams, and dash across the compound. It looks as though they're heading for the biological laboratories. Kanye, Kanye wonders if Ratana is working there, if she even knows of the warfare above ground. A tree shatters, shatters beside her as another tank round explodes. They know we're up here, even if they can't see us, I says. As if to emphasize his words, a hail of disc winds overhead, embedding themselves in the burnt forest trunks, gleaming silver in the gleaming silver in the black wood. Kanya motions to her men that they should pull back. The other white shirts, all their uniforms carefully smeared now with soot and ash, scamper deeper into the guttering forest. Another shell drops below them. Burning teak splint splinters wind through the air. This is too close. She gets up and runs, pie, dog pie dogging her. Hiroko streaks past, takes cover behind a black fallen log, and waits for them to catch up. Can you imagine fighting that? Pai gasps. Kanya shakes her head. Already the wind-up has saved them twice. One spy spying out the shadow movement of commandos coming toward them, the second time pushing Kanya down a moment before a rain of spring discs shredded the air above her head. The wind-up's eyes are sharp, where Kanya's are not. 
and she is blisteringly fast. Already, though, she is flushed, her skin dry and scalding to the touch. Hiroko is not built for this tropic warfare, and even though they pour water on her to try and keep her cool, she is fading. When Kanya catches up, Hiroko looks up at her with fever-bright eyes. I will have to drink something soon. Ice. We don't have any. The river, then. Anything. I must return to Yashimoto-sama. There's fighting all along the river. Kanya has heard from others that General Pracha is at the levee, trying to repel the landing navy boats. Fighting his old ally, Admiral Noi. Hiroko reaches out with a with a scalding hand. I cannot last. Kanya searches around her, seeking an answer. Bodies are everywhere. It's worse than a plague. The men and women ripped by high explosive. The carnage is immense. Arms and legs. A foot separated and flung into a tree branch. Bodies piled and burning. Napalm hissing. The clank of tanks rumbling through the compounds. The burn of coal exhaust. I need the radio, she says. Pichai had it last. But Pichai is dead and they aren't sure where the radio has gone. We aren't trained for this sort of thing. We, su we were supposed to stop blisterest and influenza, not tanks and megadons. When she finally finds a radio, it is from a dead hand that she takes it. The crank is... She cranks the handset, tests the codes that the Ministry uses for discussing plagues, not warfare. Nothing. Finally, she speaks into the clear. This is Captain Kanya. Is there anyone out there? Over. The long pause. The crackle and static. She repeats herself. Again, she repeats. Nothing. And then... Captain, this is Lieutenant Apichakt. She recognizes the assistant's voice. Yes, where's General Pracha? More silence. We don't know. You aren't with him? Another pause. We think he's dead, he coughs. They used a gas. Who is our ranking officer? Who is our ranking officer? Another pause. I believe it's you, ma'am. She pauses. You are in charge, didn't <laughs> Pretty you? Pretty much. <laughs> she pauses, shocked. It can't be. What about the fifth? We haven't heard. General Sam? He was found in his home, assassinated. Also, Karmatha in Phylin. It's not possible. It is rumor, but they have not been seen. And General Pracha is believed. And General Pracha believed it when we received word. No other captains. Vera Makadi was at the anchor pads, but all we see is fire from there. Where are you? An expansion tower near Fraram Road. How many do you have with you? Maybe 30. She surveys her people with dismay. Wounded men and women. Hiro Hiroko lying against a dead shorn banana tree. Face flush like a Chinese paper lantern. Eyes closed. Perhaps dead already. Pleadingly, she wonders if she cares about the creature or... Her men are all around her, watching. Kanya takes in their pathetic ammunition, their wounds, so few of them. The radio crackles. What should we do, Captain? Lieutenant Apchart asks. Our guns don't do anything against tanks. There's no way for us, the channel crackles with static. From the direction of the river, a deep explosion rumbles. Private Sarawut climbs down from a tree. They stop shelling the docks. You're alone, Pai murmurs. Chapter 44. That's so close. It's the silence that wakes her. Kimiko has passed the night in a blurry sprawl. 
periods of sleep broken by the rumble of high explosions and the whine of high-capacity springs unleashing. Tanks clank down the streets, burning coal, but much of it is distant. Battles fought in other districts. On the streets, bodies lie abandoned, casualties of the riot now forgotten in the larger conflict. A strange silence has settled over the city. A few candles twinkle in windows where people keep midnight watch on the ravaged, ravaged city, but nothing else is lit. No gas lights in the buildings or on the streets. Total blackness. It seems that the entire city's methane has run out or someone has finally shut off the mains. Yumiko pulls herself out of the garbage, wrinkling her nose in disgust at the discarded melon rinds and banana peels. Against the flame-worn sky, she can see a few columns of smoke, but nothing else. The streets are empty. There is no better time for what she plans. She turns her attention to the tower. Six stories above, Anderson Sama's apartment waits. If only she can get to it. At first, she hoped to simply speed through the lobby and find her way higher, but the doors are locked and guards patrol within. And she is too well known to risk an attempt at direct entrance. But she has an alternative. She's hot, terribly hot. The green coconut she found and smashed early in the night is a wistful memory now. She counts the balconies again, one after the other, rising above her. Water is up there, breezes, survival, and a temporary hiding place if she can make it. A rumble comes from the distance, then a crackle like fireworks. She listens, best she listens, best not to wait any longer. She scrambles for the lowest balcony. It is cased in iron bars, as is the one above. She pulls her up, herself up the face of the first and second balconies, using the easy handholds of the bars to climb. She stands at last on the open third balcony, panting with the effort. She feels dizzy with heat with heat building within her. Below her, the alley cobbles beckon. She looks up at the balcony lip of the fourth floor. She gathers herself and jumps and is rewarded with a good handhold. She pulls herself up on, on the fourth balcony. She, she, she perches on its railing, staring up at the fifth. The heat of, it, of, the, of her exertion is building. She takes a breath and jumps. Her fingers catch. She dangles in the open air, looks down and immediately regrets it. The alley is far below now. She slowly pulls herself up, gasping. The apartment within is dark. No one stirs. Yumiko tests the iron lattice of the security gate, hoping for a lucky entrance, but it's locked. She would give anything to drink water now, to pour it over her face and body. She studies the security gate's construction, but there's no way for her to break in. One more jump. She returns to the balcony's edge. Her hands are the only part of her that seems to sweat like a normal creature's, and now they are slick as oil with her body's moisture. She wipes them again and again, trying to make them dry. The intense flesh is too much exertion. The intense flesh of her, of her, of too much exertion is swallowing her. She scrambles up onto the balcony's lip, balances. Dizzy, she crouches, steadying herself. Her fingers scramble at the balcony's rim, then slip. She crashes back, slamming against the lower railing. Her ribs explode, explode with pain, and she flips over and smashes into, into potted Japanese into potted jasmine vines. Another blossom of pain flares in her elbow. She lies, whimpering among shattered pottery, in the night jasmine's perfume. Blood gleams black on her hands. She can't stop whimpering. Her whole body is shaking. She's burning up with the exertion of climbing and jumping. She pushes herself up awkwardly, cradling her damaged arm, expecting people to come charging out at her. 
but the apartment beyond the gate remains dark. Yumiko staggers to her feet, leans against the balcony rail, looking up at her goal. You foolish girl, why do you try so hard to survive? Why not just jump and die? It would be so much simpler. She peers down into the black alley below. She doesn't have an answer. There's something in her genetics, as deeply ingrained as her urge to please. She hauls herself up again onto the rim, balancing awkwardly, cradling her throbbing arm. She looks upward, praying to Mizu Mizu Mizuko Jizo, the wind-up called Hibisa, to give her mercy. She jumps, reaching one reaching one-handed for salvation. Her fingers catch and slip away. Yumiko lashes out with her bad hand and catches hold. Her elbows ligaments her elbows ligaments tear away. She yelps as the bones separate, then crack wide. Sobbing, breath sobbing sobbing, breath sawing in and out of her throat. She scrambles for the railing with her good hand, seizes a handhold, and lets her broken arm fall and hang them. Yumiko dangles, one-handed, high above the street. Her arm is nothing but flinning. She whimpers quietly, preparing to wound herself once again. She lets out a rag sob, then reaches up once again with her ruined arm. Her hand closes on the railing. Please, please, just a little more. She lets her weight settle into the arm. White pain. Yumiko saws ragged breath into her throat. She hauls a leg up. Feeling with her foot, scrambling for a toehold, finally it hooks on the iron. She pulls herself up, teeth gritted, sobbing, refusing to let go. Only a bit more. The barrel of a spring gun presses against her forehead. Yumiko opens her eyes. A young girl grips the pistol in trembling hands. She stares at Yumiko, terror-stricken. You were right, she whispers. The old Chinese man looms behind her. His exp making a child do his dirty work. <laughs> Sorry. An old Chinese man looms behind her, his expression shadow. They peer over the balcony pre precipice, watching Imiko as she dangles. Imiko's hands begin to slip. The pain is almost unbearable now. Please, Imiko whispers, help me. Like the shit that thirteen girl has gone that thirteen year old girl gone has gone through. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. The gas lights in Akarat's operations sent center gutter out. Anderson straightens in the sudden darkness, surprised. The fighting has been desultory for some time, but all across the city it is the same. Chrome Thep's gas lamps are winking out. Green points of light smother down the thoroughfares one by one. A few zones of conflict still flicker yellow and orange with burning weather all, but the, all of the green is gone from the city. The black blanket covers it almost completely as that of the ocean beyond the levees. What's happening? Anderson asks. The dim glow of computer monitors is all that lights the room. Akarat comes back inside from the balcony. The operations room buzzes with activity. Emergency hand crank lantern LEDs come to life. Oh, excuse me. Spattering light around the room, illuminating Akarat's smiling face. We've taken the methane works, he says. The country is ours. You're certain. The anchor pads and docks are secure. The white shirts are surrendering. We've gotten word from their commanding officer. They will be laying down their laying down their weapons and surrendering unconditionally. The word is going out over their over their coded radio now. A few will fight on, but we have the city now. Anderson rubs at his broken ridge. Does that mean we can leave? Accurate nods. Of course. I will detail men to escort you back to your homes in just a little while. The streets will take a bit of time to settle. He smiles. I think 
You will be very happy with the new management of our kingdom. A few hours later, they're ushered in, into an elevator. They plunge into the street level and find Akarat's personal limousine waiting. Outside, the sky is just starting to lighten. Carlisle stops on the stops on the verge of climbing into the car, staring down the thoroughfare where the yellow edge of dawn is thickening. Now that's something I wasn't expecting to see. I, th I thought we were dead. You seemed cool enough. Anderson, Anderson shrugs gingerly. Finland was worse. But as he climbs into the car, he has another coughing fit. It goes on for half a minute, racking, racking him. He wipes blood off his lips. Carlisle stares. Are you alright? Carlisle asks. Anderson nods as he gingerly pulls the door closed. I think I am busted up inside. Akarat used a pistol on my ribs. Carlisle studies him. Are you sure you haven't caught something? Are you kidding me? Akarat laughs, which makes his ribs hurt. I work for Agrigen. I've inoculated against diseases that haven't been released yet. The car accelerates away from the curb with, a, with an escort of kink spring scooters swarming around the cold diesel limo. Anderson settles himself more comfortably in a seat, watching as the city slides past beyond the, beyond the glass. Carlisle taps a leather armrest thoughtfully. I'll have to get me one of these. Once the, once the trade starts flowing, I'm going to have a lot of money to spend. Anderson nods, distracted. We're going to need to start shipping calories right away. Famine relief. I want to commission our dirigibles immediately. As a stopgap, we'll bring you Texan from India. Give Akrat something to crow about. Benefits of open markets and all that. Lots of good press from the whisper sheets. Get things cemented. <sighs> you just can't enjoy the moment, Carlisle laughs. It's not often you escape a black hood, Anderson. The first thing we do is go find some whiskey and a rooftop and watch the damn sunrise over the country we just bought. That's what we do first. The rest of the crap will all wait for tomorrow. The limousine makes a turn into Frarum, Frarum the first road, and their escort forges ahead of them, hurtling past the rapidly lighting city. They come down off a flyway and detour around a rubbed ex uh, rubbled expansion tower. A rubbled expansion tower that has been entirely toppled in the fighting. Few people are scavenging in the wreckage, but no one is armed. It's over, Anderson murmurs, just like that. He feels tired. A pair of white shirt bodies lie half, lie half off the curb, ragged all alone. A vulture stands beside them, edging closer. Anderson touches his ribs gingerly, suddenly glad to be alive. You know someplace we can buy that whiskey? Chapter 46 The old Chinese man and the young girl crouch away from her, watching carefully as she guzzles water. Yumiko was surprised when the old man allowed the girl to help her help her crawl over the balcony's edge, but now that she is safe, he keeps his spring gun trained on her, and Imiko understands that he is not motivi motivated by charity. Did you really kill them? He asks. Imiko gingerly lifts the glass and drinks again. If she didn't hurt so much, she could almost enjoy the fact that they are afraid of her. With water, she feels vastly improved. Even with her right arm lying, lying limp and swollen in her lap, she sets the glass on the floor and cradles her wounded elbow close. She breathes shallowly through the pain. Did you? He asks again. She shrugs slightly. I was fast. They were slow. They are speaking Mandarin, a language she hasn't used since her time with Gendo-sama. English, Thai, French, Mandarin, Chinese, accounting, political, protocol, catering, and hospitality. 
So many skills she doesn't use anymore. It took a few moments for her memories of the language to surface, but then it was there, like a limb that had been atrophied from long neglect and then miraculously turned out to be strong. She wonders if her broken arm will heal less easy easily, if her body still holds surprises for her. You are the yellow card secretary from the factory, she says. Hawk Singh, yes? Anderson-sama told me you ran away when the white shirts came. The old man shrugs. I came back. Why? He grins without humor. We cling to whatever floats we have. Outside, an explosion rumbles. They all look toward the sound. I think it's ending, the girl mur murmurs. That's the first one in more than an hour. Yumiko thinks that the two of them that with the two of them distracted, she could probably kill them both, even with her shattered arm. But she's too tired, tired of destruction, tired of slaughter. Beyond the balcony, the city smoke, the city smokes against a light, lightning sky. An entire city torn to ribbons over what? A wind-up girl who couldn't keep her place. Yumiko closes her eyes against the shame of it. She can almost see Mizumi Sensei frowning disapproval. She's surprised that a woman still holds any power over her at all. Perhaps she will never be free of her old teacher. Mizumi is as part of her as her wretched poor structure. You want to collect the reward for me? She asks. Wish to profit from catching a killer. The ties want you very badly. The apartment's locks rattle. They all look up as Anderson-sama and another Gaijin stumbles through the door. Dark bruises decorate the foreigners' faces, but they are laughing and smiling. Smiling. They both stop short. Anderson-sama's eyes flick from Imiko to the old man to the pistol that now points at him. Hawk Seng? The other ga Gaijin backpedals and slips behind Anderson-sama. What? What the hell? Good question. Anderson Sama is studying the scene before him, pale blue eyes evaluating. The girl Mai makes a refle reflexive Y to the Gaijin. Imiko almost smiles in recognition. She too knows that knee jerk urge to show respect. What are what are you doing here, Hawk Sang? Anderson Sama asks. Hawk Sang gives him a thin smile. You aren't pleased to capture the killer of the son that shall pray. Anderson Sama doesn't respond. Just looks from Hawk Sing to Imiko, back again. Finally, he asks, How did you get in here? Hawk Sang shrugs. I did, after all, find this flat for Mr. Yates presented the keys to him myself. Anderson Sama shakes his head. He was a fool, wasn't he? Hawk Sang inclines his head. With a chill, Imiko sees that this confrontation can only turn against her. The only person here who is disposable is herself. If she is quick, she can simply strip the pistol from the old man's hand, just as she took the pistols from those slow bodyguards. It will hurt, but it can be done. The old man is no match for her. The other guy, Jin, is slipping out of the door without another word, but Imiko is surprised to see Anderson Sama does not retreat as well. Inside, he instead he eases into the room. Hands held up, palms out. One of his hands is bandaged. His, his voice is soothing. What do you want, Hawk Sang? Hawk Sang backs away, keeping space between himself and the Gaijin. Nothing, Hawk Sang shrugs slightly. The killer of the sun that shall pray, shall pray is righteously punished. That is all. Anderson Sama laughs. Nice. He turns and settles carefully into a couch. Grunts and winces as he leans back. Smiles again. Now, what do you really want? The old man's lips quirk, sharing the joke. What I've always wanted. A future. Anderson Salmon nods thoughtfully. You think this girl will help you get that? Get you a nice reward? The capture of a royal assassin will surely earn me enough to rebuild my family. Anderson Sama doesn't say anything, just stares at Hawk Sang with his cold blue eyes. His gaze turns to Imiko. 
Did you kill him? Really? A part of her wants to lie. She can see in his eyes that he that he wants that lie as well, but she can't force the words out. I am sorry, Anderson Sama. And all the bodyguards too. They hurt me. He shakes his head. I didn't believe it. I was sure Akarat set it all up. But then you jumped off the balcony. His unsettling blue eyes continue to watch her. Are you trained to kill? No. She recoils, shocked at the suggestion, rushes to explain. I did not know. They hurt me. I was angry. I didn't know. She has an overwhelming urge to kowtow, her, kowtow herself, kowtow before him, to try and convince him of her loyalty. She fights the instinct, recognizing her own genetic need to roll over on her back and bare her belly. So you're, you're not an assassin, trained? Yes, a military wind-up? No, not military. Please, believe me. Still dangerous. You tore the Samda shall pray his head off with your bare hands. Miko wants to protest, to say that she is not that creature, that it was not her. But the words won't come out. All she can do is whisper, I did not take off his head. You could kill us all if you wanted, though before we even knew you were coming, before Hawk Sang could even lift his pistol. At these words, Hawk Sang whips his spring gun back to point at her, pathetically slow. Imiko shakes her head. I do not wish to wish it, she says. I only wish to leave, to go north. That is all. But still, you're a dangerous creature, Anderson Sama says. Dangerous to me, to other people. If anyone saw me with you, he shakes his head and grimaces. You're worth far more dead than alive. Yumiko readies herself, prepares for the excruciating pain that will come. First one, first the Chinese, then Anderson-sama. Maybe not the little girl. I'm sorry, Hawksang, Anderson-sama says abruptly. You can't have her. Yumiko stares at the gaijin, shocked. The Chinese laughs. You would stop me? Anderson-sama shakes his head. Times are changing, Hot Sang. My people are coming in force. All our fortunes will be changing. It won't just be the factory anymore. It will be calorie contracts, freight, freight shipping, R&D centers, trade negotiations. Starting today, everything changes. And this rising tide will raise my ship as well. Anderson La Sama laughs. Then winces, touching his ribs, more than ever, Hawk saying. We'll need people like you more than ever. The old man looks from Anderson Sama to Imiko. What's about Mai? Anderson Sama coughs. Stop worrying about small things, Hawk saying. You're going to have an almost unlimited unlimited expense expense account. Hire her. Marry her. I don't care. Do what you like. Hell, I'm sure Carlisle would find a place for her too. It would find a place for her too if you don't want her on your own payroll. He leans back and shouts out in the hall. I know you're still there, you coward. Get in here. The guy Jen Carlisle's voice calls in. You're really going to protect that wind up? He peers through the corner, cautious. Anderson Sama shrugs. Without her, we wouldn't even have an excuse for the coup. He gives her a crooked smile. That must be worth something. He looks again at Hawk saying, Well, what do you think? You swear this? The old man asks. If we break faith, you can always report her later. She's not going anywhere soon. Not with everyone on the lookout for a wind-up assassin. We all benefit. Every one of us. If we come to an agreement. Come on, Hawk saying. This is an easy call. Everyone wins for once. Hawk Sang hesitates, then gives a sharp nod and lowers his gun. Yumiko feels a sudden flood of relief. Anderson Sama smiles. He turns his attention to her and his expression softens. Many things will be changing now. We can't let anyone see you. There are too many people who will never who will never forgive. You understand? Yes. I will not be seen. Good. Once things calm down, we'll see about getting you out of here. 
For the moment, you'll stay here. We'll splint up that arm. I'll get someone to bring in a case of ice. Would you like that? The relief is almost overwhelming. Yes, thank you. You are kind. Anderson Selma smiles. Where's that whiskey, Carlisle? I need a toast. He gets up, wincing, comes back with an array of glasses and a bottle. As he sets the glassware down on a small end table, he coughs. Goddamn Acura, he mutters, and then he coughs again in a deep, hoarse sound. Suddenly, he doubles over. Another cough racks him, and then more follow in wet rattling in a wet rattling series. Anderson Sama puts out a hand to steady himself, but instead jostles the table, tips it. Yumiko watches as the glasses and the whiskey bottle slide toward the edge of the table, spill off. They fall very slowly, glinting in the light of the rising sun. They're very pretty, she thinks, so clean and bright. They shatter across the floor. Anderson Sama's coughing spasm continues. He collapses to his knees amongst the shards. He tries to get up, but another spasm seizes him. He curls over on his side. When coughing finally releases him, he looks towards Himiko, blue eyes staring out from sunken hollows. Akira really cracked me up, he rasps. Boxing and Mai are backing away. Carlisle has an arm over his mouth, frightened, eyes peering over the crook of an elbow. It's like the factory, Mai murmurs. Himiko crouches dead down beside the gaijin. He, s he suddenly seems small and frail. He reaches for her, clumsy, and she takes his hand. Blood spackles his lips. Well, I think he died. I mean, we'll find out. Frankly, I blame Hawk Sang. Um, probably in agreement. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's something brewing in the algae baths? I think I'll keep it a secret. <laughs> the formal surrender occurs on the open parade grounds before the Grand Palace. Akarat is there to greet Kanya and accept her, her crab of submission. Already, Agrigen ships are in the docks, unloading new text rice and soy pro onto the docks. Excuse me. The sterile seeds of the grain monopolies, some to feed people now, some to go to Thai farmers in the next planting cycle. From, from where she stands on the parade grounds, Kanya can see the corporate sails with their red crest logos billowing above the levee room. There was a rumor that the young queen would oversee the ceremony and, and cement the new government under Accra, and so the throngs are larger than would be expected. But, the la but at the last moment, word came that she would not, after all, attend, and so they all stand in the heat of the dry season that has gone on too long already. Sweating and, and sweltering as Accra steps up on a dais while monks chant, he swears oath as he swears oaths as the new Samdat Shalpreya to protect the kingdom in this unsettled state of military law. He turns and faces the army and civilians and remaining white shirts under Kanya, all arrayed before him. Sweat trickles down Kanya's temples as she refuses to, but she refuses to move. Even though she surrendered the environment ministry into Akarat's hands, still she wishes to present it in the best, most disciplined light. And so she remains at attention, sweating with Pi in the front ranks beside her, beside her. Her face schooled into careful Im Im immobility. She catches sight of Narong standing a little behind Akarat, watching the proceedings. He inclines his head to her, and it is all she can do not to scream at him, to shriek that all this destruction is his fault, wanton and pointless and avoidable. Kanya grits her teeth and sweats and drills her hatred into Narong's forehead. It's stupid. The one she hates is herself. She will formally surrender the last of her good men and women to Akarat to see the white shirts disbanded. JD stands beside her, watching thoughtfully. 
you have something you want to say, Kanye mutters. J.D. shrugs. They took the rest of my family in the fighting. Kanye sucks in her breath. I am sorry. She wishes she could reach out, touch him. J.D. smiles sadly. It is war. I always tried to explain that to you. She wants to answer, but Akarat beckons for her. Now is the time for her abasement. She hates the man so. Now, how it is that her youthful rage can be so undone? She swore as a child that she would destroy the white shirts, and yet now her victory has the reek of the ministry's burning grounds. Kanya climbs the steps and performs her crab. Akarat allows her to remain prostrate for a long time. Above her, she can hear him speaking. It is natural to grieve a man such as General Pracha. Such as General Pracha, he says to the multitudes. Though he was not loyal, he was passionate. And for that, if nothing else, we owe him a measure of respect. His days were not the, his only days. His last days were not his only days. He labored on behalf of the kingdom for many years. He worked to preserve our people in times of great uncertainty. I will never speak against his good work, even if at the end he went astray. He pauses and says, we as a kingdom must heal. He looks down at them all in the spirit of goodwill. I am very happy to announce that the queen has accepted my request that all the combatants who fought on behalf of General Praksha and his coup attempt, and his coup attempt are granted amnesty unconditionally. For those of you who still wish to work at the Environment Ministry, I hope that you will continue to work with pride. We face all manner of hardships, and we cannot know, know what our future holds. He motions for Kanya to stand and walks across to her. Captain Kanya, though you fought against the kingdom and the palace, I grant you both a pardon and something more. He pauses. We must reconcile. We as a kingdom and a nation must reconcile. We must, we, we must reach across to one another. Kanya's stomach tightens. She feels sick with disgust at the whole proceeding. Akra says, as you are the highest ranking member of the Environment Ministry, I now appoint you to its head. Your duty is as it was. Protect the kingdom and her royal majesty, the queen. Kanya stares at Akra. Behind him, Narong is smiling slightly. He inclines his head, showing respect. Kanya is speechless. She wise deeply. Shocked. She wise, deeply shocked. Akarat smiles. You may dismiss your men, General. Tomorrow, we must once again rebuild. Still speechless, she wise again, then turns. Her first attempt at an order comes out as a croak. She swallows and gives the order again, her voice cracking. Faces as surprised and uncertain as her own feels. Stare up. Stare up at her. For a moment, she fears they know her for a fraud, that they will not obey. Then ranks of white shirts turn as one. They march away, uniforms flashing in the sunlight. JD marches with them. But before he does, he wise to her as if she truly is a general. And this hurts more than anything that has come before. They're leaving. It's done. Anderson lets his head fall back on the... Whoops. What is this? Right. They're leaving. It's done. Anderson lets his head fall back on the pillow. We've won, then. Yumiko doesn't respond. She's still looking out toward the distant parade grounds. Morning light burns through the window. He's shivering, freezing, and grateful for the onslaught of sun. Sweat pours off of him. Yumiko lays a hand on his forehead, and he's surprised to feel that it is cool. He looks up at her through his haze of fever and sickness. 
Is Huck staying here yet? She shakes her head sadly. Your people are, n are not loyal. Emerson almost laughs at that. He pushes ineffectually at his blankets. Nico helps him strip them away. No, they're not. He turns his face to the sun again, soaking it up, allowing it to bathe him. But I knew that. He would laugh more if he weren't so tired, if his body didn't feel as if it was breaking apart. Do you want more water? She asks. Thought doesn't appeal. He's not thirsty. Last night he was thirsty. When the doctor came at Akarat's orders, he would have drunk the ocean, but now he's not. After examining him, the doctor went away, fear in his eyes, saying that he would send people, that the environment ministry would, ha would have to be notified, that white shirts would come to work some black containment magic on him. All that time, Mimiko hid, and after the doctor went away, she waited with Anderson through the days and nights. At least he remembers her in fractured moments. He dreamed, hallucinated. Yates sat with him for a time at his bed, laughed at him, pointed out the futility of his life, peered into his eyes and asked him if he understood, and Anderson tried to answer, but his throat was parched. No words could force their way out, and Yates laughed at that as well, and asked him what he thought of the newly arrived Agrigen trade representatives, representative coming to take his niche. If Anderson likes being replaced any better than he had, and then Emiko was there with a the cool cloth, and he was grateful, desperately grateful for any sort of attention, for her human connection, and he had laughed weakly at the irony. Now he looks at Emiko through bleary vision and thinks about debts he owes and wonders if he will live long enough to pay them. We're going to get you out, he whispers. A new wave of shivering takes him. All, all through the night he was hot and now abruptly he is cold. Shaking with the freezing feeling, with the freezing feel, as if he returned to the upper Midwest and freezes, upper Midwest and freezes in those still cold winters, as if he looks out at snow. Now he is cold and not thirsty at all, and even a wind-up girl's fingers feel icy against his face. He pushes weakly at her hand. Is Hawk saying here yet? You are burning up. Yimiko's face is full of concern. As he come, Anderson asks. It is intensely important that the man that the man come, that Hawk Sang be here, in the room with him, though he can barely remember why. It is important. I think he will not come, she says. He has all the letters he he, he has all the letters he needed from you. The introductions. He is already busy with your people, with the new representative, the Boundary Woman. A Cheshire appears in the balcony. It yowls low, and slips inside. Himiko doesn't seem to notice or care, but then she, she and it are siblings, sympathetic creatures, manufactured by the same flawed gods. Anderson watches dully as the cat makes its way across his bedroom and molts through the door. If he weren't so weak, he would throw something at it. He sighs. He's past that now, too tired to complain about a cat. He lets his gaze roll up to the ceiling in the slow whir whirl, of the cr whirl of the crank fan. He wants to still be angry, but even that has gone. At first, when he discovered that he was sick, when the hawk sang and the girl had pulled back alarmed, he had thought they were crazy, that he hadn't been exposed to any vectors. But then, looking at them, at the fear and uncertainty, he had understood. The factory? He whispered, repeating the girl Mai's words, and Hawk Sang had nodded, keeping his, his hand over his face. Fining rooms, or the algae baths, he murmured. 
Anderson wanted to be angry then, but the sickness was already sapping his strength. All he could summon was a dull rage that quickly burned away. Has anyone survived? One, the girl had whispered. And he had nodded, and they had slunk away. Hawk sang, always with his secrets, always with the angles and his planning, always waiting. Is he coming? He has a hard time forcing the words out. He will not come, Yumiko murmurs. You are here. She shrugs. I am new people. Your sickness does not frighten me. That one will not come. Not the Carlisle man either. At least you're leaving, at least they're leaving you alone. Kept their word there. Maybe, she says, but she lacks conviction. Anderson wonders if she's right. Wonders if he's wrong about Hawk saying as he was wrong about so many things. Wonders if his every understanding of the place was wrong. He forces away the fear. He'll keep faith. He's a businessman. Yumiko doesn't answer. Cheshire jumps onto the bed. She shoots it away, but it jumps up again, seemingly sensing the carrion opportunity he represents. Anderson tries to raise a hand. No. He croaks. Let it stay. Chapter 49. So Chapter close! 49. We are at three hours, but I suppose if you want to finish... I can finish this. All right. <laughs> Agrigen people march off the docks. Kanya and her man stand at attention and honor an honor guard, an honor guard for demons. The Farang all stand and squint at the tropic sun, taking in the land they have never seen before. They point rudely at young girls walking down the street, talk and laugh loudly. They are an uncouth race, so confident. They're very self-satisfied, Pi mutters. Kind of startles at hearing her own thoughts voiced aloud, but doesn't respond. Simply waits while Akarat meets these new creatures. A blonde, scowling woman called Elizabeth Bound boundary is at their head, an agrogen creature through and through. She has a long, sweeping black black cloak as do others of the agrogen people, all of them with their red wheat crest logo shining in the sun. The only satisfying thing about seeing these people in their hated uniforms is that the tropic heat must be awful for them. Their faces shine with sweat. Agarat says to Kanya, these are the ones who will be going to the seed bank. Are you sure about this? She asks. He shrugs. They only want samples. Genetic diversity for their gene ripping. The kingdom will benefit as well. Kinda studies the people who used to be called calorie demons and who now walk so brazenly into Krungtheth, the city of divine beings. Crates of grain are coming up off the ship and being stacked on Megadont wagons. The Agrigen logo, prominent on every one. Seeming to sense her thoughts, Agarat says, we've passed the time when we can hide behind our walls and hope to survive. We must engage with this outside world. But the seed bank, Kanya protests quietly, King Rama's legacy? Agarat nods shortly. They will only be taken samples. Do not concern yourself. He turns to another Farang and shakes hands with them in the in the foreign style. Speaks with him using the Angrit language and sends him on his way. Richard Carlyle, Akarat comments as he returns to Kanya's side. We'll have our pumps, finally. He's sending out a dirigible this afternoon. With luck, we'll beat the rainy season. He looks at her significantly. You understand all, you understand all this. You understand what I'm doing here. It is to, it is better to lose a little of the kingdom than everything. There are times to fight and times to negotiate. We cannot survive if we are entirely isolated. History tells us we must engage with the outside world. Kanya nods stiffly. J.D. leans over her shoulder. 
At least they never got Jibusen. I would... I would... I would rather give them Jibusen than the seed bank, Kanya mutters. Yes, but I think that losing the man was more irrit... It was even more irritating to them. He nods at the boundary woman. She was quite enraged. Shouted even. Lost all her face. Paced back and forth, waving her arms. He demonstrates. Kanye grimaces. Akarat was angry too. Akarat was angry too. He was after me all day, demanding to know how we could have allowed the old man to escape. A clever one, that one. Kanye laughs. Akarat? The Gene Ripper. Before Kanya can plumb more of JD's thoughts, the boundary woman and her seed scientists approach. An ancient yellow card Chinese man approaches with her. He stands ramrod straight, nods to Kanya. I will be translating for Kun Elizabeth boundary. Kanya makes herself smile politely as she studies the people before her. This is one, this is what it comes to. Yellow cards. Parang. Everything has changed, J.D. sighs. It would be good for you to remember it. Cling to the past, worrying about the future. He shrugs. It's all suffering. The Farang are waiting for her, impatient. She guides them down the war-damaged streets. Somewhere in the distance, off near the anchor pads, a tank booms. Perhaps a cell of holdout students. Perhaps not under her control. People not under her control, people beholden to different sorts of honor than she. She waves the two of her new underlings, Malivalia and Euthicon, if she remembers correctly. General, one of them starts, but Kanya scowls at him. I told you, no more generals, no more of that nonsense. I am a captain. If captain was good enough for JD, then I won't name myself higher. Malivalia. Wise apology. Kanya, Kanya orders the Farang into the comfort of the cold diesel car. Then they are whispering. Then they are whispering through the streets. It is a luxury that she has never has never experienced. But she forces herself not to exclaim at Akarat's suddenly exposed wealth. The car slides through the empty streets, making its way toward the city pillar shrine. Fifteen minutes later, they emerge from the car into burning sun. Monks lower their heads in courtesy to her, acknowledging her authority. She nods back, feeling sick. In this, King Rama the Twelfth placed the environment ministry even above monks. The monks throw open gates, lead her and the rest of the entourage down below into the cool depths. Airtight doors swing up, filtered air under positive, positive pressure wafts. Filtered air under positive pressure wafts out. Perfectly humid air, chilly. She forces herself not to clutch her arms and to clutch her arms to her as the cool increases. More vault doors open, revealing interior corridors powered by cold burning systems. Triple fail safe. Monks and Saffron wait politely, stepping away from her to ensure that she doesn't come into contact with them. She turns to the boundary woman. Don't touch the monks. They have taken vows not to touch women. The yellow card translates in into the Farang's squawking language. Kanya hears a snort of laughter behind her, but forces herself not to react. The Boundary Woman and her Gene Ripper scientists all chatter excitedly as they work their way deeper into the seed bank. The yellow card translator doesn't bother to explain their weird exclamations, but Kanye can guess most of them from the delighted expressions. She leads them deeper into the vaults, to the cataloging rooms, all the time thinking on the nature of loyalty. Better to give up a limb than to give up, a, up the head. The kingdom survives when no other countries fall because of Thai practicality. Kanye glances back at the Farang, 
Their greedy pale eyes scanned the shelves, the vacuum-sealed containers of thousands of seeds, each one of them a line of defense against their kind. The true treasure of, the, of a kingdom laid out before them, the spoils of war. When the Burmese toppled Ayutthaya, the city fell without a fight. And now again it is the same. In the end, after all the blood and sweat and deaths and toil, after the struggles of seed saints and martyrs like Fra Seu, after the sale of girls like Kip to Chibu to Jibusin and all the rest, it comes to down, down to this Farang standing triumphant at the heart of a kingdom betrayed once again by ministers uncaring for the crown. Don't take it so badly, J.E. Touches on, touches on her shoulder. We all must come, come, come to terms with our failures, Kanya. I am sorry for everything. I forgave you a long time ago. We have our patrons and our loyalties. It was Kama that brought you to Akarat before you came to me, come to me, came to me. I never thought it would come to this. It is a great loss, JD agrees and shrugs. But even now, it doesn't have to be this way. Kanya glances over at the frame. One of the scientists catches her eye says something to the woman. Kanya can't tell if it's mocking or thoughtful. Their wheat crest logo, logos gleam in the flicker of electric lighting. J.D. raises an eyebrow. There is always Her Majesty the Queen, yes? And what would that, and what can that accomplish? Would you not prefer to be remembered as a villager of Bang Rajan who fought when all was lost? and held the Burmese at bay for a little while than as one of the cowardly courtiers of Ayutthaya who sacrificed a kingdom. It's all ego. It's all ego, Kanya mutters. Maybe, J.D. shrugs. But I'll tell you true. Ayutthaya was nothing in our history. Did the Thai not survive the sack of it? Have we not survived the Burmese, the Khmers, the French, the Japanese, the Americans, the Chinese, the calorie companies, have we not held them all at bay when others fell? It is our people who carry the lifeblood of this country, not this city. Our people carry the names of the Chakri the Chakri gave us, and it is our people who are everything. And it is this seed bank that sustains us. But his majesty but his majesty declared, her majesty declared that he would always defend. King Rama did not care one ounce for Kung Krung Thet. He cared for us, and so he made a symbol for us to protect. But it is not the city, it is the people that matter. What good is a city if the people are enslaved? Kanya's breathing has become rapid. Icy air sols in and out of her lungs. The boundary woman says something. The jean rippers yelp at their awful tongue. Kanya turns to Pai, follow my lead. She draws her spring gun and fires it point blank into the furring woman's head. Mm. Still not over. Well, I mean, that happened. <laughs> Kanya's deciding to be a, a better, trying to be a better person, I guess. By shooting someone in the head. Yes. Yeah. That's... Well, by doing what she thinks will be best for her people, mm. instead of being out for revenge. But, yes. Elizabeth Boundary's head jerks back. Blood sprays. Hawks, Hawk Sang, blood sprays Hawk Sang in a fine mist, spattering his skin and newly tailored clothes. The white shirt general turns, and Hawk Sang is imme immediately drops to his knees, making a crab of obeisance beside the collapsed body of the former devil. The blonde, the blonde creature's surprised dead eyes stare out at him as he prostrates himself. Spring gun discs chatter across the walls. People are screaming. Suddenly, there is silence. The white shirt general yanks him to his feet and shoves her spring gun into his face. Please. Hawksing whispers and tie, I am not their kind. 
The general's hard eyes study him. She nods sharply and shoves him aside. He huddles against a wall as she begins barking orders to her men. They quickly drag the agrogen bodies aside, then coalesce around her. Hawk Sang is surprised at how quickly the unsmiling woman musters her troops. She goes to the monks of the seed bank, makes her own crab of respect, and begins speaking quickly, even though she performs a crab to their spiritual authority. There can be no doubt that she is the one who is the master of this place. Hawk Sang's eyes widen as he hears what she is planning. It's terrifying, an act of destruction that cannot be allowed. And yet, the monks are nodding, and now people are streaming out of the seed bank, all of them working quickly. The general and her men begin throwing open doors, revealing rack after rack of weaponry. She begins assigning teams. The Grand Palace of Korokat, of Korokat Pump, Kulong Toy Sea Wall Lock. The general spares a glance at Hawk Sang as she finishes dispatching her people. The monks are already taking seeds down from the shelves. Hawk Sang cringes at her attention. After what he has heard, she cannot intend to let him live. The bustle of activity increases. More and more monks stream in. They stack the seed cases carefully. Rank after rank of seeds coming down from the shelves. Seeds from more than a hundred years ago. Seeds that every so often are cultured into, this, into the strictest of isolation chambers and then carried back to the underground safe to be stored again. The heritage of millennia in the boxes, the heritage of the world. And then the monks are streaming out of the seed bank, carrying boxes on their shoulders, a river of shaven-headed he shaven men in saffron robes bearing forth their nation's treasure. Hawk Sang watches, breathless at the sight of so much genetic material disappearing into the wilds, somewhere outside. He thinks he hears monks chanting, blessings of the project of renewal and destruction. And then the white shirt general is looking at him again. He forces himself not to duck his head, not to grovel. She will kill him. She must. He will not grovel and piss himself. At least he will die with dignity. The general purses her lips, then simply jerks her head toward the open doors. Run, yellow card. The city is no longer a refuge for you. He stares at her, surprised. She jerks her head. She jerks her head again, and the shadow of a smile touches her lips. Hawk Sang rises quickly and climbs off his knees. He hurries through the tunnels and out into the hot open air. Air, the river of saffron robed men all around him. Once, once they reach the temple grounds, the monks disperse through various gates, separating into smaller and smaller groups. A diaspora bound eventually for some prearranged place of, dif of distant safety. A secret place far from Calorie Company Reach, watched over by Fra Seu and all the spirits of the nation. Hawk Sang watches for a moment longer as the monks continue to pour from the seed bank, and then he runs for the street. A rickshaw man sees him and slows to a stop. Wait, there's still blood on him. No, I'm not going to question it. <laughs> Hawk Sang leaps in. Where to? The man asks. Hawk Sang hesitates, thinking furiously. The Ancapads. It's the only certain way to escape from the coming chaos. The Anguizi, Richard Carlyle, is probably still there. The man in his dirigible, preparing to fly to Kolkata to retrieve the kingdom's coal pumps. There will be safety in the air but only if Hawk Sang is fast enough to catch the foreign devil before he untethers the last anchor. Where to? My. My. Hawk Sang shakes his head. Why does she torment him now? He owes her nothing. She's nothing. In truth, she's just a fishing girl, and yet, against his better judgment, he allowed her to, sh he allowed her to stay with him, told her he would hire her as a servant of some sort, would keep her safe, it was the least he could do, but that was before. He was going to be flush with money from the calorie companies. It was a different sort of promise then. She will not forgive him. The anchor pads, Hawk Sang says. Quickly, I don't have much time. Rickshaw then nods and the bike accelerates. My. Hawk Sang curses himself. He's a fool. Why does he never focus on the most important goal? Always he is distracted, 
Always he fails to do what would keep him alive and safe. He leans forward, angry with himself, angry at mine. No, wait, I have another address. First to Kronthan Bridge, then to the anchor pads. That's in the opposite direction, Foxing grimaces. You think I don't know it? The rickshaw man nods and slows. He turns his bike and aims it back the way they came, the way he came. He stands on his pedals, getting up to speed. The city slides past, colorful and busy with cleanup activity, a city completely unaware of its impending doom. The cycle weaves through the sunshine, shifting smoothly through its gears, faster and faster toward the girl. If he is very lucky, there will be enough time. Hoxang prays that he will be lucky, prays that there will be enough time to collect Mai and still take the dirigible. If he were smart, he would simply run. Instead, he prays for luck. Epilogue! Time to get to the end. Ooh. Destroyed locks and sabotage pumps take six days to kill the, kill the city of divine beings. Imiko watches from the balcony of the finest apartment tower in, in Bangkok as water rushes in. Anderson-sama is nothing but a husk. Imiko squeezed water into his mouth from a cloth as he sucked at it like a baby before he finally expired, whispering apologies to ghosts that, he, that only he could see. When she first heard the colossal explosion at the edge of the city, she did not guess at first what was happening, but more explosions followed and twelve coils of smoke rose like Naga. Along the levees, it became clear that King Rama XII's great floodwater pumps had been destroyed, and that the city was once again under siege. Himiko watched the fight to save the city for three days, and then the monsoons came, and the last attempts at holding back the ocean were abandoned. Rain gushed down, a vast deluge sweeping out dust and debris, sending every bit of the city swirling and rising. People swarmed from their homes with their belongings on their heads. The city slowly filled with water, becoming a vast lake, lapping around secondary story windows. On the sixth day, Her Royal Majesty the Queen announced, announces the abandonment of the city of the divine, announces the abandonment of the divine city. There is no song that shall pray now, only the queen and the people to rally her. The white shirts, so despised and disgraced just days before, are everywhere, guiding people north under the command of a new tiger, a strange, unsmiling woman who people say is possessed by spirits and who, drive her, and who drives her white shirts to struggle and save as many of the people of Krongtheth as possible. Himiko herself is forced to hide as a young volunteer in a white shirt, white uniform works the halls of her building, offering assistance to anyone who needs food or safe water. Even as the city as the city dies, the environment ministry is rehabilitated. Slowly, the city empties. The lap of seawater and the yowl of Cheshires replace the call of durian sellers and the ring of bicycle bells. At times, Imiko suspects that she is the only li only person living. When she cranks the radio, when she cranks the radio, that the that, that the capital has decamped. Wait a minute. When she cranks a radio, she hears that the capital has been decamped north to Ayathaya. Once again, above sea level. She hears that Akarat has shaven his head and become a monk to atone for his failure to protect the city, but it is all distant. With the wet season, Imiko's life becomes bearable. The flooded metropolis means that there is always water nearby, even if it's a stagnant bathtub stinking with refuse of millions. Imiko locates a small skiff, uses it to navigate the city's wilderness. Rain pours down daily, and she lets it bathe her, washing away everything that has come before. She lives by scavenge and the hunt. She eats Cheshires and catches fish with her bare hands. She's very quick. Her fingers flash down to spear carp whenever she desires it. She eats well and sleeps easily, with, and with the water all around, 
She does so greatly. She does not so greatly fear the heat that burns within her. If it is not the place, if it is not the place for new people that she once imagined, it is still a niche. She decorates her apartment. She crosses the wide mouth of the Shao Freya to investigate the Mishimoto factory where she had once been employed. It is shuttered, but she finds remnants of her past and collects some of them, calligraphy torn and left behind. Raku Chawan bowls. A few times she encounters people. Most of them are too occupied with their own problems of survival to bother with the TikTok preacher more, more glimpsed than seen. But there are a few who prey on a lone girl's perceived weakness. Himiko deals with them quickly, and with such mercy as she, and with as much mercy as she know, knows how. The days pass. She becomes comfortable. Entire, she becomes comfortable entirely in her in her world of water and scavenge. She's so comfortable, in fact, that when the gaijin and the girl find her scrubbing her laundry from atop a second floor apartment rail, they surprise her utterly. And who is this? A voice asks. Imiko draws back, startled, and nearly falls from where she perches. She jumps down and darts, splashing into the safety of the abandoned apartment shadows. The Gaijin's boat's boat bumps against the rail. Sawati, crap, he calls. Hello. The old model skin and bright intelligent He's old, mottled skin and bright intelligent eyes. The girl is lithe and brown with a soft smile. They both lean against the balcony railing, peering into the dimness from their boat. Don't run away, little thing, the old man says. We are quite harmless. I can't walk at all. And Kip here is a gentle soul. Himiko waits. They don't give up, though. Just continue to peer at her. Please, the girl calls. Against her better judgment, Imiko steps out, wading carefully in the ankle-deep water. It has been a long time since she has spoken to a person. Kichi kichi, the girl breathes. The old gaijin smiles at the words. New people, they, are, they call themselves. His eyes contain no judgment. He holds up a limp, up a limp pair of Cheshires. Would you like to dine with us, young lady? Himiko motions toward the balcony rail where she has tethered her own day's catch on, from just under the water. I do not need your help. The man looks down at the string of fish, then at her with new respect. I suppose you don't. Not if your design is the one I know. He invites her closer. You live near here. She points upstairs. Lovely real estate. Perhaps we could dine with you this evening. If Cheshire is not your taste, we could certainly enjoy a bite of fish. Himiko shrugs, but she is lonely, and the man and girl seem harmless. As night falls, they light a fire a fire of kindled furniture from her apartment balcony and roast the fish. Stars show through gaps in the clouds. The city stretches before them, black and tangled. When they are finished eating, the old gaijin drags his wounded body closer to the fire while the girl attends him. Tell me, what is a wind-up doing here? Yumiko shrugs. I was left behind. Ourselves as well. The old man exchanges smiles with his friend, though I think our vacation will be ending soon. It seems we are to return to the pleasures of calorie deten detente and genetic warfare, so I think that the white shirts will once again have uses for me. He laughs at that. Are you a gene, a gene ripper? Yumiko asks. More than just that, I hope. You said you know about my platform. The man smiles beckons his girl over to him and runs his hand idly up her leg as he studies Imiko. Imiko realizes the girl is not entirely what she is what she seems. She is a boy and a girl, together. The girl smiles at Imiko, seeming to sense her thoughts. I have read about your kind, the old man says, about your genetics, your training. Stand up, he barks. Imiko is standing before she knows it, standing and shaking with fear and the urge to obey. The man shakes his head. It's a hard thing they have done to you. Yumiko blazes with anger. They also made me strong. I can hurt you. Yes, that's true, he nods. 
They took shortcuts with your, they took shortcuts. Your training masks that, but the shortcuts are there. Your obedience, I don't know where they got that. A laboratory of some sort, I suspect. He shrugs. Still, you are, you are better than human in almost all other ways. Faster, smarter, better eyesight, better hearing. You are obedient, but you don't catch diseases like mine. He waves at his scarred leg, scarred and oozing legs. You are lucky enough. Yumiko stares at him. You are one of the scientists. You are one of the scientists who made me. Not the same, but close enough. He smiles slightly. I know your secrets, just as I know the secrets of Megadons and total nutrient wheat. His... He nods at his dead Cheshires. I know everything about these felines here. If I cared enough, I might even be able to drop a genetic bomb in, in them in them that would strip away their camouflage and over the course of generations turn them into turn them back into less a le their less successful version. You would do this? He laughs and shakes his head. I like them better this way. I hate your kind. Because someone like me made you. He laughs again. I'm surprised you aren't more pleased to meet me. You're as close as anyone ever comes to meeting a god. Come now, don't you have questions for god? Yumiko, Yumiko scowls at him, nods at the Cheshires. If you were my god, you would have made new people first. The old Gaijin laughs. That would have been exciting. We would have, we would have beaten, we would have beaten you just like the Cheshires. You may yet, he shrugs. You don't, you do not know, you do not fear Cephasosis, blister us. No, Yumiko shakes her head. We cannot breed. We depend on you for that. He moves, he moves her, she moves her hand, telltale stutter stop motion. I am marked, always. Always we are marked. As obvious as tin hand, as a tin hands or a megadont. He waves a hand dismissively. The wind up movement is not a required trait. There's no reason it couldn't be removed. Sterility? He shrugs. Limitations can be stripped away. The, s the safeties are there because of lessons learned, but they are not required. Some of them even make it more difficult to create you. Nothing about you is inevitable. He smiles. Someday, perhaps all people will be new people, and you will look back, and you will look back on us as we now look back on the poor Neanderthals. Yumiko falls silent. The fire crack crackles. Finally, she says, Do you know how to do this? Can you make me breed true, like Cheshire's? The old man exchanges a glance with his lady boy. Can you do it? Yumiko presses. He sighs. I cannot change the mechanics of what you already are. Your ovaries are not existent. You can you cannot be made fertile any more than the pores on your skin supplemented. Yumiko slumps. The man laughs. Don't look so glum. I was never much enamored with women's eggs as a source of genetic material anyway. He smiles. A strand of your hair would do. You cannot be changed, but your children, in genetic terms, if not physical ones, they can be made fertile, a part of the natural world. Yumiko feels her heart pounding. You can do this, truly. Oh yes, I can do that for you. The man's eyes are far away, considering. A smile flickers across his lips. I can do that for you, and much, much more. Hey. The end. The end. Bam. So they leave a lot up to speculation. That's the end of the world. It's fine. Oh, well, it's the end of a city. People got away. And no. It's like right up at the very end, everyone suddenly tries to do the new, the the good thing based on their ideals. I more meant like robot revolution. You know? Oh yeah. I mean, she's not a robot. Close enough. 
but yeah, so so yeah, the it's it's implied that over generations, the new genetically enhanced people are gonna be the the survivors. Yep. And it's implied Hawk Singh and my get away, but that's kind of left in the air. Um, Akarat gets what he deserves. Yeah, a lot happens. But it's definitely, this was definitely my favorite book. It was a good one. It was very interesting. It seemed like people enjoyed listening to it. I'm glad that is the case. <laughs> but, uh... Thanks for listening, everybody. That's going to be the end. So we're going to wrap up here, and uh, we'll figure out what to do with Fridays going forward. Yep. Well, you all have a great night, and we'll see you next time.